House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with House Rule 67, the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing on six bills today. And as there is time, we will exec bills that we've already have heard previously. Please note there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate to this meeting by Zoom, by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the General Court website. <clears throat> the notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access, to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us, Christopher Shea and Jennifer Four. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Start the meeting by taking a roll call. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Representative Bernstein, if you do the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today is February 17th, 2021, and we're going to do a roll call vote. Uh, we'll begin with Representative, I'm sorry, we'll do a roll call, not a vote. Uh, we'll begin with Representative Abrami. Here in my home in Stratum, uh, my wife's house. Subbing for Representative Mary Griffin is Representative Joe Alexander. Uh, good morning, uh, Representative Alexander. I'm here in Gosstown. Uh, my roommates are in and out of the room. Thanks for having me. Uh, Selving for Representative Jordan Overy is Representative Tim Lang. Representative Lang, I'm in my home here in Samaritan, New Hampshire. My son and a contractor may be running around behind me. Very good. Welcome, Tim. Uh, Representative Ober. Here in Hudson at home with the usual six cats. Representative Doucette. Uh, good morning. Here in Salem, my home office alone. Uh, Representative Burstein is your humble clerk today. He's at his home office in Nottingham. Representative Robert Elliott. Here, and my wife is uh, in the uh, living room somewhere. Representative Janigian. Here in my home office in Salem, and my wife and daughter are somewhere in the house. Representative Nunez. Thank you, Representative Burstein. Good morning. I am in my home in Pelham. Representative Baxter. Uh, he texted me saying he was running late. We'll get back to him. Uh, Representative Spillsbury. Here at my home in Charlestown alone. Representative Tudor. Here in Northwood alone. Representative Almy. Here in my home in Lebanon alone. Representative Richard Ames. Yes, I'm here in Jaffrey in my home office alone. Representative Southworth. Here in Dover alone. Representative Malloy. Here in Greenland alone. Representative Thomas Schomburg. Uh, I'm at the Payson uh, Library in Concord Hospital uh, alone. Representative Edith Tucker. I'm in Randolph alone. Representative Gomarlo. I am in Swansea alone. Representative Laufman, Thomas Laufman. Representative Laufman. Representative Gord. Good morning. I am present and alone. Representative Hacken Phillips. Good morning. I, I'm joining you from my office in Concord alone. Representative James Murphy. Good morning. I am in my home office in Hanover. Representative Major. Good morning. I'm in my office in my home and my wife is in the house. Okay, I'm going to mark Representative Baxter absent. So Mr. Chair, there are 22 present and two uh, not here. 
Thank you, Representative Bernstein. We will start the public hearing. On House Bill 102, an act relative to worldwide combined reporting for unitary businesses under the business profits tax. And Representative Schomburg is the prime sponsor. And Representative Schomburg, it's yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Representative Schomburg, uh, Merrimack 4, towns of Wilmot and Sutton. Uh, for our new members of the, of the Ways and Means, uh, I did send a uh, two attachments to Representative Major and Representative Brahmi. Uh, I will resend those to everyone uh, when I get back home today. Uh, one is uh, an article that was printed in tax notes, and the other are the bullet points that I was using for House Bill 102 so that uh, if everybody remembers last year, I gave a 45 minute presentation. I'm trying to keep it just down to five or six minutes this year. Um, this uh, uh, House Bill 102 is being reintroduced from the former House Bill 1567, which last year went to interim study. Uh, a good criteria, as I mentioned, of a good tax policy, as we all and we know in ways and means, is the equitable treatment of all taxpayers. And this one is dealing with the BPT tax. Just as a quick review, uh, New Hampshire relies on its business profits tax more than any other state and most countries. And I started researching uh, how our state taxes, the profits of multinational corporations uh, uh, operate in our state and elsewhere after reading a January 2019 article titled A Simple Fix for a $17 billion loophole and it, how states can reclaim revenue lost to offshore tax havens. And that was by the uh, ITEP Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy and the American Sustain Sustainable Business Council. Uh, the design of this bill is to counteract income tax avoidance by multinational corporations uh, via uh, profit shifting to tax havens and foreign jurisdictions. My concern is that New Hampshire does not treat all multinational taxpayers equitably with domestic taxpayers and that the unitary water's edge method grants an unconstitutional advantage to foreign based multinationals operating in our state. Understand that I'm not opposed to foreign acquisitions of New Hampshire companies. What I'm opposed to is foreign corporations operating in New Hampshire that pay zero or minimal, minimal corporate income taxes. This House Bill 102 would reform our New Hampshire BPT tax accounting method from water's edge to worldwide combined reporting method that would mandate companies include their U.S. profits held in offshore tax haven accounts when calculating their taxes. This uh, profit shifting uh, is accomplished through uh, basically intercompany transactions via transfer pricing at supposedly an arm's length when dealing with a subsidiary. It would be like uh, company A owns subsidiary company B, and instead of doing what they would do with most companies that are out in the public, uh, they supposedly are saying we are dealing with an arm's length when we ask for a price or we want to buy this from them, just like we would do with somebody, uh, another company out in the public. Uh, the transactions basically are treated as if unrelated and not affiliated. And in my research with the GAO, the IRS, and even here in New Hampshire, uh, the Supreme New Hampshire Supreme Court had mentioned in a case in 1999, we point out that the water's edge method was adopted for the benefit of foreign businesses. And this has brought me now to why I reintroduced this bill. Uh, what this does is 
it causes domestic companies that do not have multinational affiliates to pay a higher effective tax rate than their multinational competitors or domestic competitors. I would like to, uh, to suggest, Mr. Chairman, that this Ways and Means Committee hopefully vote to retain this bill so that a Ways and Means Study Committee can delve into all the aspects of worldwide combined reporting versus unitary waters edge accounting method and that all members would be able to attend. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. <clears throat> thank you for your testimony, uh, Representative Schamberg. Questions of Representative Schamberg? Uh, let me get my thing going here. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't, I don't really have specific questions. I'm quite familiar with this from last term. Um, and I think we decided last term that we, we definitely needed to study this thoroughly before we acted on any, any, any bill uh, that would change the way we treated the water's edge companies. So um, I, I would support, I would support uh, us taking a, a look at it more, um, if anything, just an educational thing. Um, I think the DRA is willing to also uh, support uh, being involved um, because it's been such a long time since we've, that even the DRA has looked at this issue. I mean, going back a couple of decades, I think. Uh, I, I view this more as educational for everybody. And I, I would support um, a motion to uh, retain and, and study. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Ames. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Representative Schamberg, for your extraordinary work on this really, really important subject and really, really complicated and hard to understand subject. So much appreciated. Um, and I share Representative Abrami's view that uh, this merits close attention by the committee and it can't be done in the rush of uh, getting bills uh, through to be considered by the full house right now, but it could be well considered uh, if retained. Um, and my question to you, Representative Schamberg, is a request that you spell out a little bit more how this transfer pricing works. Um, how is it that a multinational, a transnational corporation um, can through, um, through being viewed as a water's edge company, um, manipulate prices in effect so that what we see here in New Hampshire or what the United States sees more broadly as the attributable property to this country or this state is much less than what it really should be. Can you answer that? Can you speak to that? I can speak to it in a general proposition. Uh, the foreign parent groups with U.S. subsidiaries, uh, like all multinational corporations, uh, as stated by the GAO and the IRS, uh, uh, may engage in income shifting to low tax jurisdictions in order to evade not only New Hampshire taxes, but to evade US taxes. Um, a a multinational corporate group, whether it's US owned or foreign owned, may have subsidiaries in uh, countries outside the United States where corporate tax rates may be lower. And uh, the corporate structure uh, can provide a, a scope for income shifting through practices such as manipulation of the transfer price from a subsidiary of theirs that, as I was saying earlier, that maybe sells it to a non-affiliated company at $10 would sell or 
transfer the price to maybe $15 between each other. And this is that arm's length approach that the, uh, uh, that is concerning is that we're not seeing the actual real profits that could be taxed in New Hampshire. Um, huh. I, I guess that's the best I can do with that right now, Representative Ames. Okay, if I could do a follow-up. Follow-up. Um, so I, I've seen examples of how this plays out uh, where a subsidiary in a low tax jurisdiction outside of the United States um, is uh, reporting taxable profits to that jurisdiction that are greater than the gross national product of that jurisdiction, um, reflecting the phenomenon that you're trying to describe. Have you seen examples like that? Oh, I don't have any particular uh, information other than articles that have been published in tax notes. Well, one of the most recent ones is what um, Coca-Cola has recently uh, been charged uh, with uh, profit shifting uh, that they had originally had approval from the IRS, but it's like you said, they went to a, uh, it was a royalty charge and they were almost $3 billion that the IRS has finally been able to hopefully recoup for the United States. Uh, I'd have to go into my research and my papers to find you some uh, examples. Fine, thank you. Okay, um, I do have something to say on this is that uh, I did talk with the DRA on this, and they said it is an extremely complicated issue. And it would take the DRA a lot of time to get up to speed on this, because the last time it was present in New Hampshire was in the 80s, and it hasn't been used since then. And so that I would uh, recommend to retain it and see if we can work with the DRA so that we can all understand what this really is. So, uh, Mr. Please, Chairman, I'm yes, sorry. Representative Schomburg. Just a little follow-up. Uh, the state of Virginia is uh, revisiting combined reporting uh, that they've turned over to a study committee also. So uh, we do have someone within the continental United States now that is undertaking a look at this also. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Tucker. Uh, yes, I, I must say that last year when the topic came up, I was afraid that I would not be able to uh, follow the discussion. And, but I think that the, really the two overriding points are that there's a possibility that there are New Hampshire companies that are being treated inequitably to in, in regard to multinationals. And two, that we could be missing out on some tax income that we should be getting. And it turned out that there are, is enough available material written for people who are not uh, PhDs in economics so that the arguments can be followed. And I hope that we can support this retention idea and have a good study. I think we'll learn a lot about the big picture of business in New Hampshire at the same time. Representative Alamey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> Last year, when we put this into interim study, it was for the same purpose as retained so that we could understand it better. And at that time, we thought that we would be able to do it last summer, last fall. And instead, we had COVID. Um, and 
in the fall when they finally got to the point where we could meet as a committee, they had to have every single committee meet as uh, to, in order to take care of their interim study bills. They told us we could only have an hour and a half for both our interim study bills. The other one took an hour during that hour and a half, if I remember correctly. Uh, and so we abandoned abandoned very reluctantly our ability to do this as a full committee. There were some of us that did meet on, on the Democratic side, and we um, have assembled a lot of, of resources, human and, and research-wise, that um, I had hoped we would be able to share by now, but on uh, this session, like the last one is being so chaotic in many ways that um, it's very difficult under COVID for the legislature that um, it isn't quite finished yet, but we will have a kind of guide to the literature on, from the people that uh, are most concerned with this issue. And there is one person in attendees who I would have hoped might, might testify, but he, apparently he didn't put his hand up uh, from that, uh, from the sustainable uh, business. Uh, I forget exactly what the name of it is, but it's a very large uh, association of businesses that do not operate internationally and feel that they are being competed against. Thank you. Um, anybody else wish to comment or test or ask questions? If not, does the committee feel that uh, we can accept this bill? Uh, we have one person that signed up to testify and I believe it might be the one. Okay, yes, represent, uh, not represent, a David Morse, a member of the public who signed up to testify in support of the bill. Mr. David Morse. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, definitely here on, uh, on behalf of myself this time, however. Uh, I wanted to uh, comment and support this uh, legislation worldwide on worldwide combined reporting specifically from a pro-business standpoint, uh, just to give you a little bit about who I am. I've been working for the last eight years on, with the expertise of small business and other experts regarding the real world consequences of Water's Edge style legislation. Uh, my primary focus is usually on the federal level, but we've been focused also on the state level for some time uh, to become completely forthright. I was also a minor contributing author on the paper that was mentioned by Representative Schamberg as credited by the tax journal Tax Notes. The reason why I support this legislation is because the Water's Edge is a product of a bygone era in international relations. And in particular, this references the United Kingdom and Japan back in the 80s when they were pressuring the United States government. Now that entire system has shifted and both of those countries along with many others are more concerned about the tax avoidance of the largest multinational companies than they are about protecting their corporations from US taxes. Now the effects that were described by Representative Schamberg are very real. There's a tax differential is what it's known as between multinational enterprises and small domestic companies. Now, in the best example that I can give for anecdote is probably the beer industry where you have Anheuser-Busch that has one of the most complicated subsidiary structures in the world. And the reason that it developed that way was so that they could gain a competitive business advantage using their subsidiaries. Uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev, you know, it's a big long name by, uh, by this point. It has management from Brazil, 
ownership from Europe and ultimately has managed to avoid paying a lot of taxes that are local craft brewers in the United States and in New Hampshire end up having to pay. Now, I will completely admit that New Hampshire could not solve the entire full tax disparity by itself, uh, but it can remove its contribution to the problem. Whenever a state finds itself in a financial crunch, there is inevitably going to be discussion of raising tax rates. However, if you have put the system in effect where one group is paying a lower percentage than the other, then when you raise the rates, you're raising, in, raising them inequitably. So you have to resolve that tax disparity first between the rates before you then move on and raise the rates overall. Otherwise, you're going to hurt more likely the small businesses in your own state than you are to affect the overall, uh, the overall tax base so that the uh, difficulty is shared equally amongst all the businesses. Now, <clears throat> I am very grateful for this moment to discuss this with the committee and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have for me. Questions for Mr. Morse. Representative Tucker. Representative Tucker, you want to unmute yourself? Could, could you have our guest please identify the group that he represents or belongs to that uh, Representative Almy couldn't quite come up with? Uh, Mr. Morse. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So I must state for the record that um, my, I am here volunteering. My, my board did not approve uh, my attendance here as part of the Coalition for a Prosperous America. That's the group that I work for as the tax policy director. However, this is a matter under their discussion as to which, whether or not they will be getting involved more directly uh, on this issue, specifically for New Hampshire. We primarily focus on the federal level. Now, the group that uh, Representative Almy was trying to bring up is a group that I'm affiliated with, I've worked with, uh, although I'm not paid directly through uh, and I'm not being paid today. And that would be the American Sustainable Business Council. They are a one of the contributing groups regarding the, uh, uh, regarding the paper that was mentioned earlier. And additionally, uh, there is a affiliate uh, coalition called the salesfactor.org. It is a group that is sponsored by a uh, gentleman by the name of Mr. Bill Parks. And, Ms., uh, and Mr. Parks is very dedicated to this issue as well. But uh, these are all groups that I have connections to and affiliations with uh, just for the record. Good, that's what I wanted. Thank you so much. Representative Abrani. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, thank you for uh, your testimony. Um, now, you know, you mentioned Anheuser-Busch, you know, year, a couple of years ago, I, it dawned on me that, that Anheuser-Busch is no longer an American company, uh, that its ownership changed hands. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of that going on for other businesses as well. Um, but uh, the, the real question I have is, uh, although Anheuser-Busch does have a pretty big footprint here in New Hampshire, a bottling uh, in New Hampshire, but... <clears throat> um, in terms of, of other states, um, Representative Schomburg mentioned Virginia is starting to look at this. Do you, do you know, of, given given your affiliations with these different organizations, do you know of other states that are are even taking a peek at this at the moment? At the moment, there has been some consideration, uh, specifically um, last year, I believe it was uh, Montana, and then there was some discussion in Oregon as well. Uh, there. The state of Alaska treats their uh, their oil revenue under a single sales factor uh, worldwide, is my best understanding of its practical application already in existence. But 
the this has been considered a natural replacement to what is known as tax haven uh, legislation. Uh, in particular, Oregon and uh, Montana had tax haven legislation where there was a blacklist of tax havens. So these are low tax jurisdictions where the, the uh, excuse me, the tax rate of that jurisdiction is so low that it is creating what is known as an investment hub. It, that's the polite way of saying they're taking the money and they're giving the best tax rate possible, even though they have so few employees there that it doesn't make any sense why that money would be stored there. But it, these investment hubs are particularly uh, energized to go back to those states and then try to uh, lobby as to why they shouldn't be considered uh, part of the tax haven list. Um, that has proven frustrating. It was particularly frustrating in Oregon. So they have uh, revised and reviewed how they're going to do this, but they haven't, uh, they haven't decided fully how they're gonna tackle the Water's Edge le legislation yet. Um, there are other states, just to mention other states on um, ways that they plan to deal with this. The biggest focus has been on what is known as digital service taxes or uh, digital advertising taxes. These, uh, Maryland just passed one of these. Um, however, many academics uh, include, uh, that I know of believe that it will not pass constitutional muster, unlike the procedure that would involve getting rid of the water's edge, which has in fact been proven to, uh, the Supreme Court has ruled on it in the past that the states have the ability to uh, get rid of their water's edge if they so choose. So it's got a stronger base to work from than digital service taxes, which is one of the reasons why I prefer it. Thank you. Representative Elliott, you want to unmute Representative Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Moores, I, I want to know because the even the sponsor's uh, motion is to retain this bill. Uh, how long does your organization need in, and others like it to come up with a bill uh, sponsored by anybody here uh, that would uh, get rid of this problem of the water's edge? Um, so do you have a time frame here that you would like to see a bill ought to pass and how long will that be? Thank you. Well, <laughs> this is difficult because it is my subjective view versus my objective view. But I will say, in all honesty, subjectively, we, Water's Edge would have been gone yesterday. Uh, however, reality being what it is, it makes absolute sense that uh, there would be some sort of study um, specifically to the state, because it is important to know what kind of revenue would be raised from such a thing. But it is important also to know that Without it, any uh, attempts to uh, move towards, say, single sales factor, which I also personally support, uh, will mean that you usually lose revenue. So you definitely need to be considering this issue when you're trying to balance how much uh, revenue would be lost versus gained in, uh, as you the state of New Hampshire decides what it's going to do about single sales factor. Um, any state that abandons the three factor model needs to know that there is probably going to be a revenue loss unless there is a uh, abandonment of the water's edge election and instead using worldwide combined reporting. So if we could have it um, sooner the better, that, but I can't testify um, in all honesty that we have a exact timeline written down. We've been taking a look at what the landscape looks like in New Hampshire right now. Um, and as I think uh, Representative Ami might have mentioned earlier, it seems very chaotic at times due to COVID. Further questions? 
Not, thank you, Mr. Morse. There thank are you. four other people that signed up. Norm, Norm, I did have a question. If he's still Please, there. Senator Bromley. Uh, is the gentleman still there? Online? I'm still here if you can hear me. Uh, yeah, you mentioned single sales factor. Um, this chamber, the, ho uh, the House is, is against moving quickly to single sales factor, but the Senate seems to want to move forward and it's, it's in law right now. Did I hear you correctly by saying that uh, Water's Edge companies would benefit uh, if we move forward with single sales factor as a state? Yes, it, by its very definition, uh, especially in smaller states, uh, it is more beneficial to have a water's edge with single sales factor for a company that can use these techniques and what is known as being tax aggressive, tax planning aggressive. So what you're saying is that your, your opinion is that this would be a negative uh, revenues to New Hampshire if this move forward. Without being able to look at the data, I can't uh, guarantee it, but it, that's been my experience that that's the result uh, when we do the modeling in other states. Okay, thank you. Good question, um, Representative Bromley. Uh, well, the there's, there's one more attendee, David Juve, that would like to speak. Okay, all right, uh, we'll bring him in before I announce the ones in opposition. Okay. Mr. Juve. Give him one second to get there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I trust you can hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify. I did sign up in opposition to this bill, but I didn't do it soon enough to show up on your list of uh, people wanting to verbally testify. For the record, my name is Dave Juve. I'm a senior vice president with the Business and Industry Association. And we had reached out to Representative Schomburg late last year, I think, or perhaps in January, to uh, meet with BIA's Fiscal Policy Committee to discuss this legislation. And we were able to have uh, a good and productive conversation. And I appreciate uh, the representative for making himself available. Um, however, the uh, committee discussion afterwards seemed to indicate there were more questions about this uh, proposal than, than answers. So um, even though BIA was opposed to the bill, I do encourage uh, the committee to uh, consider retaining this, although I, I have to express a concern with that too. And my concern is this is such a complicated issue and there are limits to uh, committee activity in terms of a retained bill uh, to me, this would represent as big a change in tax policy for the state as moving to market-based sourcing or moving to single sales factor. Both of those issues had a full-blown commission, which gave the legislature time to really do a deep dive into the issue. It also allowed them to plan uh, for expert testimony and also to have expertise on the commission from people who had experience in those issues. And I recognize that changing this to a commission um, where you can do a deep dive and have a little more time than having to report out sometime in the fall has its limitations too. One is uh, we're, we're not sure how the Senate would respond to that. And obviously you don't need Senate support for a retained, uh, um, a retained bill. Uh, all that is to say is uh, I would support uh, the committee doing uh, much more additional work on this legislation and uh, would certainly support a uh, commission uh, as opposed to retained study just to give uh, more chance for expertise testimony and more time to, to make the right decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Jave. Questions for Mr. Jave? Uh, saying none. Uh, uh, there's one more hand raised in the attendees. Uh, GBA is all it says. Hold on one second. Oh, it's gone. Oh, nope, it's back. 
<laughs> we have to be careful because there are people who know how to work the system. Yeah. The last minute, after listening to everybody, they jump in. So. And they lowered their hand, so. Okay. We have four people that have signed up to oppose the bill, but they're not going to testify. And they say they're all members of the public and representing themselves, such as David Matthew, uh, David Morse. And these four people are Alexander Manella, Elliot Axelman, Nicholas Thomas, and Paul Babb. Are there anybody else who to testify for or support of the bill? If not, do you think we have enough information to uh, exec this bill out now? If you I think we move forward we we can't, we shouldn't exec this bill out now, uh, let me know. If not, then maybe Representative Schamberg might want to make a motion. We're going, we're yeah. going to executive session and Representative Schamberg. Uh, Representative Schamberg would like to make a motion to retain this bill, House Bill 102, in Ways and Means. I, I okay. second. Representative Brownie seconds. Representative Schamberg made the motion to retain the bill, seconded by Representative Bromley. Any further discussion on this motion to retain? I see none. Uh, what, uh, Mr. Chairman, Zanami. I'd just like to ask that we manage to put considerable time into this if, if we retain it. On um, We do. I really would like to see it retained, but to make sure that that uh, whoever is really interested in following this up can can meet several times in the the late summer or fall. And my feeling is is that they will be meeting a few times, but they will not it will not be enough, and that they would recommend legislation to form a commission, so it can be adequately studied with sufficient time. That would be excellent. Uh, any further discussion on the motion to retain? Since none, I'm gonna ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could remind everyone to unmute and let's, let's see how well we do. Let's begin the roll call vote on HB 102. The motion is retained. Begin with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Alexander. Yes. Lang. Yes. Ober. Yes. Clerk Burstein votes yes. Doucette. Representative Doucette. You're muted, Fred. Fred, you're muted. Yeah. And you're not on video either. Fred, you got to. There we go. Whoop. And one of them. You got a last thread. <laughs> Still muted. Technical stuff this morning. Sorry. Fred. Did you say yes? Unmute first and then say yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Representative Doucette. Representative Elliott. Yes. Canigian. Yes. Nunez. Nunez votes yes. Baxter. Yes. Billsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Almy. Yes. Ames. Yes. Southworth. Yes. Malloy. Yes. Schamberg. Representative Schamberg votes yes. Tucker. Yes. Gomarlo. Yes. Lofman. You're muted, Tom. Yes. Thank you. Gord. Yes. Hacken Phillips. Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. Chairman Major, the final vote is 24 in favor of retaining, zero against. 
With a vote 24 to zero, the motion to retain passes. Thank you. Consent? No, it doesn't go on the calendar. Okay. Uh, we have 13 more minutes. So since we have 13 more minutes, we could probably do House Bill 355, which looks like- God damn it, it's fine. <laughs> it's <a> great time. <laughs> Like to go into House uh, Executive Session on House Bill 355 relative to Kino and the. Uh, let me grab that. Mr. Chairman, I've got a procedural question. Yes. Why is Representative Lang voting? He's replacing. Uh, hold on one second. Don't worry. Bang is replacing, replacing Representative Early. Oh, thank you. I missed that when we went around. Yeah. And Alexander's replacing Mary Griffin. Yes, that I got. Hmm. <sighs> Okay, House Bill 355 is an act relative to Kino. Do I hear a motion? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to retain House Bill 355. And that's uh, Representative Tudor. Is that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The motion is to retain House Bill 355 by Representative Tudor. Do I have a second? I'll second. Representative Brahmi. Okay. The motion is to retain House Bill 355 made by Representative Tudor, second by Representative Romney. Discussion? Saying no discussion, then I'm gonna ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's begin the roll call vote with Representative Patrick Abrami. Yes. Representative Joe Al Alexander. Yes. Representative Lang. Yes. Representative Ober. Yes. First team, the clerk votes yes. Doucette. Yes. Elliot. Okay, so you see that. Oh, you okay. Yes. Thank you, Representative Elliot. Mm -hmm. Representative Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Baxter. Yes. Hillsbury. Yes. Scooter. Yes. Almy. Yes. Ames. Yes. Southworth. Yes. Malloy. Yes. Hamburg. Representative Hamburg votes yes. Tucker. Yes. Joe Marlowe. Yes. Dolphman. Representative Tom Lofman. Lofman. Put Tom down is not voting unless we see him. Representative Gord. Yes. Hacken Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. Representative or Chairman Major. Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 23 to nothing with one member not voting. Motion. Um, Mr. Mr. Representative Burstein, this is Tom, Tom Lockman. I vote, I vote yes. Also. Okay, you made it. Uh, Mr. Chair, the vote is 24 to nothing in favor of the motion to retain. The vote being 24 to nothing. Motion on House Bill 355 to retain it passes. Okay, we can do one more retained bill. House Bill 364. 
Make the motion to retain. Uh, Representative Brummy makes the motion to retain. Representative Romney makes a motion of retain on House Bill 364. Burstein will second that. Burstein seconds it. Speak to my motion when you're ready, Represent, uh, Mr. Chair. Representative Romney, you want to speak to your motion? Yes, this is uh, Representative Rulery's bill. Uh, Rep Representative Rulery realizes that this bill needs some work on. Uh, even though he's not here today, he did say yesterday that he's willing to uh, uh, see this bill be retained. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, as we talked this bill through, there were more and more federal tax codes that came into play as to which of the which of the charities would fall under this raffle bill. Um, we need to need to clarify all of that. Not enough time now to do it, so let's let's retain it and uh, and do it right. I think if we limit the number, my 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 personal feeling is that I, I don't have a problem with certain charities being able to play raffle raffles, but uh, we just it, it, the bill's not ready, and uh, and I don't think uh, Representative Ullery felt he had enough time to to fix the bill or for the committee to fix the bill uh, uh, before deadline. So thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Begin the roll call vote on HB 364. The motion is retained. Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Alexander. Yes. Lang. Representative Lang. Yes. Thank you. Representative Ober. Yes. Clerk Burstein votes yes. Doucette. Yes. Elliot. Bob. A mute. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Fred. <laughs> Just a suggestion everyone should unmute themselves. Um, continue the roll call vote with Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Baxter. Yes. Hillsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Almy. Yes. Ames. Yes. Southworth. Yes. Malloy. Yes. Hamburg. Representative Schamberg votes yes. Tucker. Yes. So Marlow. Yes. Laughman. Yes. Korg. Yes. Hacken Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 24 to nothing in favor to retain. House Bill 364 was voted out as 24 to zero to retain. Thank you. We have five minutes left. So we can do House Bill 565. Uh, let's pull that House Bill 565, an act establishing a committee to study charitable gaming. Do I hear a motion? I'd like to make a motion. Representative Tucker. Your motion. Well, who, who said they'd like to make a motion? I did. Okay. Would you make a motion? Yes, uh, that uh, HB 565 uh, ought to pass. Representative Tucker moves HB 565 ought to pass. Do we have a second? Second, Representative Brami. Second by Representative Abrami. Discussion. Any discussion on the motion of what to pass on 565? Seeing none, ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
All right, gang, let's get this done without incident. <laughs> let's begin with uh, Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Alexander. Yes. Lang. Yes. Ober. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Doucette. Yes. Elliot. Yes. Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Baxter. Yes. Hillsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Almy. Yes. Ames. Yes. Southworth. Yes. Malloy. Yes. Schamberg. You're muted, Tom. Tom, you're muted. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on a minute. I got to get the video now. Am I on? Okay. Yep. okay. Representative Schamberg votes yes. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker. Yes. Go Marlowe. Yes. Balkman. Yes. Gorg. Yes. Hacken Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 24 to nothing for HB 565. The motion of all to pass carries. Okay. Uh, House Bill 565 passes with a vote of. 24 to zero without objection. We go on the consent calendar. Anybody object? I see no objection. So we'll go on the consent calendar. Now, for previous bills, we need to exact, not right now, it would be CACR1, CACR2, House Bill 10, once we find out what we really want to do with that. House Bill 15, we have some clarification on that from the DRA, but we'll get into that on the second. Oh, we're going to have work session on all the bills that we've heard on the 2nd and the 3rd of March. There's no time for work sessions next week because we're, we're doing revenues on the 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th is going to be session days, and then the following Tuesday is the 2nd. The other bill is We need to do more work on House Bill 210, 568, and 626. So those are all of our bills that we've heard, and we haven't exact them yet. So we're right on time. Uh, Mr. Chair. Major, I've moved the sponsor into the panel. Uh, before we start, Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative Brown. Is the is there are there going to be any other bills today that we're going to exec other than the ones that we're hearing that we may exec? No. Okay. Thank you. So um, take that intelligence and um... <laughs> run with it. Okay. And we thank uh, Representative Alexander and Representative Lyon. Okay, next is a House Bill 252. House Bill 252 is an act creating a committee to study the creation of a program giving employer tax on business taxes in exchange for providing stipends for childcare needs to employees. We have one person that has signed up. We have Representative Fenton here to present his bill. Right, I haven't mentioned that yet. Yeah, he, he missed the sign up timeline. I, I see. In addition to the sponsor, we have one that have signed up to support it. 
And then we have 24 that have signed up to oppose it. So Ms. Representative Fenton being the prime sponsor, you're on. Absolutely, can you folks hear me? Yes. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Uh, I did miss up my sign up deadline. Uh, my wife and I had a baby last week. So oh, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Things have been a little crazy and that's I why I'm also not on video because the bags under my eyes are reaching the floor, so. Was it your first? No, this is our second. We have a, we have a two year old, so things have been even more crazy. <laughs> but all, all happy and healthy. So thank you for asking. Um, yeah, so I am, I am Representative Donovan Fenton. Uh, I represent Keene. I'm here to, uh, today to talk to you about HB 252, which is creating a committee to study the creation of a program giving employers tax credits on business taxes in exchange for providing stipends for childcare needs to employees. And that is a mouthful. So I will keep this brief because um, we're talking about a study committee. Uh, the reason for this bill, um, I came up with this um, because I lost employees during COVID-19. We have a family business and I'm proud to say we didn't lose anyone because business was slow and we had to get rid of them, but because we lost them uh, because they had to stay at home and take care of their kids who were out of school. Um, daycares closed, schools closed, so one parent had to stay home. Uh, you know, this pandemic has really changed how we look at everything. You know, parents are home now and so are kids. Uh, they can't juggle being on a Zoom call while trying to get their child logged onto their math class. Um, and so we need to get them back to work. You know, they're, they're the backbone of New Hampshire's economy. Um, you know, options for funding childcare are limited, which is why business tax credits could be a potential avenue for bolstering this field. Uh, I know several credits already exist for the uh, BBT, such as CDFA investments, nonprofits, scholarships. So this could fall in line. Um, you know, this would be a study committee uh, to study this issue to see if it's feasible to implement. And with that, I'll take any questions or, yeah. Questions from the committee. Uh, questions from the committee. Uh, Representative Alamy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Fenton, did you consider any other way than uh, cutting further into our business taxes to do this? Or so, would it just be studying how much it would cost to do it? Yeah, absolutely. And Representative, thank you for the question. So the reason I chose kind of the business um, taxes, um, you know, the, the way I look at it is, you know, the marginal rate of the BPT is not what's affecting our economy right now. I think childcare, remote learning is what the issue is, you know, and I think it would just pay itself forward if we have um, employers who can hire more uh, uh, employees, you know, because um, a lot of people can't work right now because of their children. Um, and I think New Hampshire has the 12th highest childcare cost in the nation. So I think this would really supplement that and get more people back to work. If that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Representative Burnley. Uh, thank you, Representative Fenton, for your testimony. Um, do you know of any New Hampshire companies that are doing this voluntarily? Representative, thank you for the question. Uh, no, I don't. Um, and I think I stated this earlier, you know, I have a family business. We actually employ 200 full-time and part-time people. Uh, and we actually, we've looked into this before and we just, you know, we can't make it feasible because the exuberant costs of childcare right now. And it's more difficult with parents at home um, who sometimes need to hire a babysitter. And, you know, I'm not saying that babysitting should be part of this program, but that's why a study committee would be fantastic to see if it's feasible for someone who is Zooming at home, you know, to hire a babysitter and that could be supplemented as well. Thank you. Any further questions? Representative Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is, I wanna get this correct now. We give the employer, a uh, tax credit and the employer uh, pays for babysitting. Is that correct? Representative Elliott, thank you for the question. Uh, yes and no. Um, child, if, so I, I use babysitting as just an example, but that wouldn't necessarily be part of this program. I was more stating that, you know, uh, working has changed since the pandemic. So, you know, some, some uh, parents are working from home and Unfortunately, they can't uh, bring their child to 
daycare because a lot of them aren't operating right now. And some might need to hire a, a babysitter for, you know, 30 minutes while they're on a Zoom call presenting a bill per se. Um, but, you know, that that could be a feasible option, not babysitting, but more on the line of uh, for child care needs, for school needs. Thank you. Further questions? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm very interested that someone has come up with um, a bill that addresses a very current problem, but it seems to be rather narrowly constructed, as I think Representative Almy pointed out, that it just talked about a credit arrangement. Would you be interested in broadening the wording so that this could also take on the study of what has happened from this pandemic, who has been affected, what kind of businesses, and what kind of employees, particularly gender related, uh, where I gather there's more of a problem, and then see where it comes out rather than coming up with a particular solution to what has turned out to be a major problem. Representative Tucker, yes, absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, and I, I would absolutely be open to broadening this bill. I think uh, I really want to get across. So the main reason for this is I want this bill to be advantageous for both the employer and the employee. You know, we're asking, um, you know, the employers to step up, uh, but we need help with an investment from that tax credit. So the reason I chose that was because I just wanted to make it so that um, businesses weren't being hurt. But I absolutely agree that, you know, we could broaden this bill. Great. Well, I, I'm sure there are lots of people who could help you who have been deeply involved in this. Obviously, you have too with your family business, but I, I hope that you can do that because I, I really think that having, uh, while we all remember what it's been like, you know, a year or two from now, it, it will the pandemic will fade in our memories and, and we have a problem. So is I encourage... There a question? Is there a question about Okay, well, further questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I have one. I'm, I'm unable to raise my hand digitally. Okay, well, So uh, thank you for visiting our committee today, Representative. Currently, if a business elects to give a stipend to an employee, they get that as a tax deduction. And what, what, you're, what you want to study a little bit more in depth is elevating that deduction to a credit. Is that correct? Representative, yes, thank you for it. So yeah, that, as you said, it, you are correct. A stipend would be, um, as it stands now, is a deductible, but would change to a credit. But again, this is a study committee that can be changed. And as uh, Representative Tucker said earlier, you know, we have the ability to mold this. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, any further questions? of Representative Fenton. Seeing none, then I'm going to call upon a Will Stewart, who is a lobbyist and representing Stay Work Play New Hampshire, and he supports the bill. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name again is Will Stewart. I'm the executive director of Stay Work Play New Hampshire which if you're not familiar with it, is a statewide nonprofit whose mission is to attract and retain more young people here in New Hampshire. And uh, we are, as you mentioned, in support of this bill, you know, because we believe that, you know, more options for creating, you know, more childcare availability um, is critical to attracting and retaining more young people here in the state. And that is very much necessary um, and critical to the future of the state. Right now, as you might be aware, New Hampshire is the second oldest state in the country with one of the lowest unemployment rates, even you know, during COVID. On top of this, we're the number one exporter of high school graduates seeking a four-year degree with some 62% of these young people leaving the state every year. Some of them come back, but many of them don't. Um, you know, in short, New Hampshire needs all the people we can get in general and all the young people we can get in particular. Our businesses need workers and customers, our towns need volunteer board members, 
and our nonprofits, churches, and civic clubs all need volunteers to accomplish their vital missions, uh, without which our communities just can't function. And you know, about three years ago, Stay Work Play, we commissioned this survey to collect data on why young people stay in and leave New Hampshire. And one of the reasons we found was uh, you know, child care available, uh, lack of child care availability and affordability. Um, you know, as uh, Representative Fenton mentioned, you know, this you know has you know profound impact impacts on workforce. And uh, you know, so again, Stay Work Play is in support of studying this issue to come up with um, you know, as many solutions as we can to address this critical issue to our workforce and to make sure that we can attract and retain the young talent that we need here in New Hampshire. So thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Stewart. Questions from the committee? Representative Almey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stewart um, had this, this bill focuses only on tax credits. We currently, the situation that we have is that the finance committee puts in the budget uh, not enough money to help with the childcare situation in the state, but it does put some money in. And wouldn't it be better if this committee broadened itself out to looking at the most efficient way for the state of of um, doing more for the child care crisis that we have, rather than just focusing on reducing the uh, general fund money that can be used for things like child care, but also substance abuse and a lot of other things that businesses need. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, for the uh, for the question. And uh, you know, I will say that. You know, I think that uh, the state should be, you know, there are lots of things that can and should you know, be done to address this issue. You know, this uh, proposal to study is, is one of those. You know, there's, there's no silver bullet. It's a, uh, a complex issue uh, to be sure. If, it, if there were an easy fix, it would have been fixed a long time ago, right? Um, I think this is you know, one potential option. Uh, there are certainly others and I would encourage uh, the legislature to explore all such avenues to address this uh, this very real workforce development uh, challenge. Further questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Now, sign up sheet had Twenty-four that have signed up opposed to this. Uh, they're all members of the public, uh, except elected official Sherry Frost. Representative Frost is in place. Norm. Yeah. Uh, Norm, uh, this is this two fifty-two. Two two fifty-two. Yeah. No, you, you read the wrong column there. I think it's uh, most of them signed up in support, 24 in support. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're right, in support. The no is not testifying. Right, thank you. Thank you. So the 24 signed up in support. Sorry about that, but they're not testifying. You just look at the wrong column, <laughs> it's okay. And I apologize for that. Um, anybody else wish to testify for or against? I don't see anything. Okay, then I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 252. On uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I would like permission to, to try to fashion an amendment that would make this a study of the most efficient way of dealing with this problem in terms of funding. Um, okay. What is your study amendment going to be? That would be different from this. This is creating a, a committee to study 
the creation of the program? It, it's creating a committee only to look at tax credits on the business taxes in order to, to promote child care needs to employees. I do not know, and I think people on the finance committee could help us figure out on which way, that way or the way they're doing now or some other way that the child care people can think of on would be the, the best way to direct funding towards this really important need. And uh, why don't you go ahead and get your amendments? Thank you. When we meet on the 2nd of March, which will be a work session day, we can discuss it. Thank you. Representative Major, may I? Yes, uh, Representative Abramian. Yeah, all due respect to, to my uh, colleague, uh, Representative uh, Almi, uh, doesn't this take this out of the realm of ways and means, what you're thinking, your amendment? It does, but if we're going to try to make our government efficient enough to live with low taxes, we have to look at these kinds of things. Right. And, and we can discuss that when we see the amendment. Okay, I'll back. I'll, I will both see what the amendment says. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else on 252? I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 252. Uh, the next bill is scheduled for 1030, so we're going to take a break until 1030. So don't go away. Just Mute your video and audio.
Okay, being 1030, I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 346, which is an act relative to the funding, to the funding source for the Domestic Violence Program Fund. The sponsor, Representative Edwards, it is yours now to present your bill to the committee. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Representative Jess Edwards. I uh, represent District 4 of Rockingham County. That's Auburn, Chester, and Sandown. Uh, today, uh, I'm coming to you, um, to many of you, as uh, a former colleague on Ways and Means. Uh, those of you who uh, I had the pleasure to serve with last term uh, have heard much of what I have to say today uh, often enough to where uh, you could probably uh, provide my introduction testimony for me. But to, to keep you interested and, and to reflect my new learning over the past many months, um, I've got some, some new and improved things I want to talk about today. Um, for, for those of you who received my written testimony, it's a, it's a Word document and on page two of that written testimony is a, a very simple little picture that is uh, sort of the quintessential, you know, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, in this case, it may be worth more than a thousand words, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume you've looked at my testimony and, and you may recall the, that, that graphic that I, I'll now describe. You know, it, it basically shows that under the current law, we have uh, two streams of money that are flowing directly into uh, our dedicated funds for domestic violence programs. Uh, the two are in a, a well-established stream from the marriage licenses, which seems to be a, a, a pretty predictable revenue stream, although it's not cut in stone. It's, it, it's got a, a, a historical behavior that looks to add about $360,000 uh, in the next budget. The um, new stream is from the marriage officiate license that we passed last term. Um, and because it's new, we don't really have a history with it, but upon looking at other states around us and, and, the, and, and how those streams have come in, we've had smart people put together their best guesstimate that 122,000 will be brought from that. So if you take the 360 for marriage licenses and, and, and accept 122 as a good estimate for um, um, the marriage officiate, uh, that, that comes in at um, $482,000. That's the amount that the governor's budget reflects. Um, I provided an abstract of the governor's budget in my written testimony as well, so that those of you who like to see hard things have it in front of you uh, when you wanna look at it. So what my bill does, and more importantly, my amendment, I, I really want you to focus on my amendment and not the underlying bill because the amendment improves it so much. What it does is it takes the uncertainty out of the funding stream that goes into the dedicated fund. It takes the uncertainty out because um, I'm committing to you that the general fund will put that full $482,000 that's reflected in the governor's budget into the dedicated fund. And the money that comes from the license fees will instead go to the general fund. So for the purposes of the general fund, it's a wash. And, and, and why is it wash, a wash? Or why is it worth doing the wash? I, I think it's worth doing the wash because we have sullied, we have dirtied the, the reputation of the institution of marriage 
because we have, as state policy, we've pretended that the act of marriage creates a, or has a nexus to the creation of additional domestic violence. And I think that nexus, that assumption of a nexus is wrong and it's insulting. Uh, and that the better way to go is to find a, a more relevant, more correct nexus for a set of special funds to be dedicated. So what I would like us to do is to take this two-year budget as a transition. That is the chair of Division Three Finance, I have some influence over ensuring that this domestic violence fund is fully paid for. That's my commitment to you. It's a commitment in writing. It's a commitment to, to you personally that I will hold um, the governor's budget request of 482,000. That money will go into the dedicated fund. And for people who wanna know why the, this dedicated fund funding is so important, it's because general funds lapse at the end of every budget. The dedicated fund is a non-lapsing account. And by putting money into this non-lapsing account, it will give the managers of the domestic violence program the more flexibility to ensure continuous flow of the contracts. Right now, as I understand it, there are very few contracts that this money pays for. I believe it may be just one. Uh, to a particular uh, organization here in New Hampshire. And I wanna assure the leadership of that coalition that I am committing here to make sure that that dedicated fund is fully uh, funded. So um, I think those are my key points. Uh, I say a lot more in my written testimony, so I would commend that to you. One, one thing I would add is I, I've also been appointed to the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention, Treatment and Recovery. And as I'm getting up to speed on what that committee does, one of the things it does is it recommends the authorizations of funds under RSA 12-Juliet colon three, and it authorizes the fund to invest in recovery services for individuals and families affected by alcohol and drug abuse. I believe that that may be a much more appropriate long-term place to, to find the funding into long into the future for um, the domestic violence program dedicated fund. So, um, so with that, I'll, I'll take questions if there are any. Well, thank you for your testimony, Representative Edwards. The first one is Representative Bromney. You're on mute, sir. Pat, you're going to have to unmute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Edwards. Um, it's always good to hear from you. So I'm actually glad you did this, but I want to make sure I understand. Um, did you have any um, influence in, on the governor and him putting this in his budget this way? I would love to pretend the governor calls me and, and asks for my advice, but he, he, he forgot to call me on this one, sir. Okay, so, but you-, you so No, I, the straight answer is no. No, sir, I didn't. So make, make sure I understand then. Um, you're saying that, uh, the, so the budget, the, 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 the budget that was forwarded to the to finance from the governor doesn't have, does not have this money in it, or, or does it have this money in it already? <laughs> It, it absolutely does. And that's why I included the abstract in your uh, written testimony that I provided. It shows the, uh, uh, the, the cutout of the governor's budget. And, and in the governor's budget, you'll see 482,000 and change, like something like 650 bucks, four, 482,652, something like that. That's the governor's projection for dedicated funds, and there are only two sources of dedicated funds. One is the marriage officiate license, excuse me, the marriage license, where if you look at it historically, it's it, it brings in anywhere from $350,000 to, to $365,000. 
And, and so I just, for estimation purposes, purposes, I put 360. And so that means that the balance from the governor's estimate and, um, and historical is about 122,000, which I assume is related to their estimates for the marriage officiate um, slice of the license. Okay, just follow up, please. Follow up. So, so okay. So I follow what's going on, and uh, basically, instead of the uh, these, well, first of all, let's start with the marriage license. Fifty dollar marriage license. The clerk, the town clerk, keeps seven dollars. The rest was going to um, the special fund. Instead, it's going to go to the general fund. And then the thing we passed last year, the special officiant license which is $85 for out-of-state people coming in to officiate a marriage, of which $5 still goes to the Secretary of State, but the remainder goes now, instead of the special fund, it goes into the general fund. Is that correct? This is your amendment. That's under current law, yes, sir. And my recommendation is to have that money to put into the general fund directly. Exactly. Your amendment has both of those now, instead of going to the Department of Human Services special fund, uh, RSA 173B15, it goes into the general fund, uh, both of those. The, the $43 per marriage license goes into the general fund and the uh, $80, $80 for the special officiant goes into the uh, general fund. So yes, basically it's, it's, it's going to the general fund and, and, and then what, what, what has to, what you're saying is for finance is going to have to rely, you're going to have to rely on finance every budget cycle to make sure it continues to fund this um, domestic violence. Is that correct? I want to uh, explore your use of the word every budget cycle, every. I am saying uh, this, this is a bridge to use general funds for this next budget, but I will come back in August to OLS so that we can look at it in January, I will find a better source of dedicated funds. And so I'll be back next year, I hope, with a, another bill to identify a source of dedicated funds so that we no longer re rely on this, the nexus of marriage, but we rely on a different nexus. And right now my best guess is to use alcohol commission money in the budget years that follow the one we're about to, to do. So, so I need a bridge of one budget to, to get us in a long-term uh, position. And I would ask that you trust that I'm in, uh, I, I really intend to do this. Okay, well, thank you. I'll let others uh, ask now. Thank you. Representative Southwick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, could you say a little bit more about the power of your amendment? Um, the reason I ask is my experience is once things get to finance, it gets very tricky about what gets cut, what gets approved, and so on. And I really want certainty for domestic violence programs, and that's what they've had, of course, in the past. So it's hard for me to kind of trust in a broad sense uh, what might happen in the future. Thank you. So thank you for the question. And it's, a, I think it's a, it's a fair one. Um, so far, uh, finance has received four bills that uh, were explicitly intended to uh, have money from the general fund appropriated to a range of different um, activities. And uh, the approach of the finance committee um, has been to discuss them. We view them all fairly positively in general, I think, but, and we're gonna retain them. We're gonna retain them so that we can see what Ways and Means, you may know that Ways and Means has to provide us with the, with the revenue estimate. Uh, and so when we get the revenue estimate, we can start taking a look at the governor's budget and uh, HB2 much more closely to determine how much um, room we have to maneuver. But I'm, I'm, I, I understand that as the chair of Division Three Finance, which controls the DHHS budget um, as a component committee of finance overall, I understand that historically the, the chair of that Division Three has had a lot of influence on 
uh, making sure that some funds are, are protected and others maybe not protected. And I am giving you 100% my commitment, Representative Southward, that I will protect the general funds sourcing of the total amount of the governor's budget into this dedicated fund. You have that as my deepest, most solemn promise. That may not mean much to you, but it, it means a lot to me. Does that answer your question, sir? You're on mute. You're on. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I just, again, really wanna know more about um, <clears throat> the power of an amendment like this in finance. And I think you know, it really depends on what's happening with the economy and a lot of other factors from my perspective. And I don't really want domestic violence uh, funding um, at risk because of what's happening uh, in other areas. Thank you. Yes, sir. If I, if I could just, um, Mr. Chair, could I just add something on to that? Sure. Um, okay, given that this is a wash through the general funds, meaning that under current law, the, the, the 482,000 approximately was intended to go direct, directly to the, direct, uh, the dedicated fund. Given that in my amendment, I'm just saying, let's put that money into the general funds and have the general funds do the appropriation from there. I, I think that's a very solid argument that most people in finance would go, okay, well, it's new money going to an old source. You know, let's, 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 let's keep the governor's promise on this. But. Okay, Representative Alamy. Susan, you, you muted. Susan, you're muted. Representative Almy, you're muted. Somebody completely muted me um, while we were gone. Um, Representative Edwards, I understand, I, I fully believe in your assumption that your assumption is that you can control this process in finance and in Senate finance. Um, I have seen a lot of cases when a division chief has been overruled by the, uh, the head of finance because of the needs of, of the state elsewhere. Um, and I have certainly, and. You, you have too seen times when the Senate finance rearranged the deck chairs and then just sat on them and said, we're not moving. So I am very concerned. The reason that it is a dedicated fund was to provide certainty for domestic violence when they had been getting less and more and less and more. Uh, and, at different times, and it does support, as you know, and I know that you have been following domestic violence problems, um, that um, there are a lot of agencies depending on this and a lot of people depending on those agencies around the state. Um, I also am worried as to if you protected this and the governor it put in his budget the money that was estimated for the dedicated fund to come from the dedicated fund. So on, um, I'm worried that you might, in order to protect this, have to get rid of the child care allocation, which we've just been talking about how important child care is to the economy of the state, um, or a number of other things that that um, we take care of. And I'm also worried because um, we could have a relapse because of COVID variants into another recession that the governor would have to be cutting. And last time he cut every new program in order to produce the surplus that he got um, and uh, or reduce the deficit quite a lot. So I'm, I'm quite worried about taking this out of dedicated fund status. I know that you have a major personal moral objection to this, the way it is funded now, but I wish that you could 
delay a little and come with your alternate source, which if it is from the Alcohol Commission is probably going to take money away from substance abuse treatment and prevention, which is at least has been the, the reason for the Alcohol Commission, which has been going since then Senator Gordon got it set up 20 years, 25 years ago, something like that. Thank you. Do you, do you have, well, I, what do you feel, you really feel that you can control us into the future? So um, I, I will admit that I, I don't know what I don't know. And I have not experienced the opportunity to be on finance or to be a, a chair of division three. So this is very new. Uh, I think your concerns are, 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 are valid for the most part. Uh, I have had a couple of good discussions with the chair of finance to let him know what I was doing and what I was thinking. And that I can assure you that the chair of finance is not surprised by this and has voiced support for this endeavor. Um, uh, I, I think I would go back to uh, one thing you said about the alcohol commission and I have so much to learn there. But it's my understanding that 5% uh, of the net profits were supposed to go be available for a range of expenses. And uh, it's and less than those five percentage points have been brought over under the Alcohol Commission. And that a greater percentage of that five percentage points is meant to come over. So there, it's like the, that fund is getting some new money. And I'm, I am not, um, I would want to just point out to you that um, I'm not creating a new line or a new justification to spend money from that commission. Uh, RSA 12 Juliet colon three already says that money can be spent on recovery services for individuals and families affected by alcohol and drug abuse. So, so the responding to the horrors of domestic and sexual violence with the alcohol money, I think is perfectly in line with the original intent and the legislative words of, of that statute. So, so that's not, that's not a hard fight. It's cert, everything's a fight, but I, that's not a hard one. I don't think. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Bromley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Edwards. I what, in all due respect, again, um, why we why do we even have to deal with this bill? Because it sounds like it's going to be an HB two. Uh, it sounds like the governor in HB two is making these proposals uh, to to have the money come out of the general fund and have these marriage license fees going into the general fund. Uh, so even if we pass this bill. The, uh, the Senate has to pass it to become law. And in the meantime, you and finance have to produce your budget by the first week of April. So, and you'll be voting on, you know, and then the floor, we'll be voting on the floor on, on the budget. Uh, so I'm assuming that before this becomes law, it's gonna be in the budget that's gonna, we're gonna be voting on. So why do we need to act on this bill? I, 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 I mean, with all the respect, I'm really trying to understand. I appreciate what you're trying to do here, just so you know. Um, but I, this is more of a, a, a procedural question than anything else. So if I led you to believe that the governor's budget is going to say in HB2 that the, these dedicated fund sources for marriage will go uh, to the general fund, then I misspoke. We've not seen HB2, and I don't, I have no reason to think that the governor will do what this amendment does. Okay. Then I misunderstood and, totally. I thought you no, said. I, I'm sure I miscommunicated. I thought but, you said that the, that, the, that the governor's budget, the budget, HB1, has 400 and whatever, $82,000 in the general fund, out of the general fund to pay for domestic violence. Is that, was I mistaken in hearing that? 
I was mistaken if I said that. I, 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 to clarify, if you look at the abstract of the governor's budget, it shows, um, let me call it up just to make sure I don't misstate. Under the line item for agency income, there is a number there $482,459 for each of the two fiscal years. That is a number that I'm sure is made up of two things. I'm, it's a guess, but I'm pretty sure. One is the longstanding historic funding source from marriage licenses, plus a guesstimate of how much money will come in under the marriage officiate bill. Those are dedicated funds sources under the governor's HB2, or it'll probably be silent on it since it's already existing law. Uh, but, but what I'm proposing is to, is to not go forward under current law. I want this amendment to change the current law so that those two sources go into the general fund and the general fund for one budget term pays for, pays into that dedicated fund. So just and that one budget will give me time to come back and say, here's a much better source for funding this domestic violence uh, appropriation. As a, as a childhood survivor of domestic violence, I want these accounts funded fully. I think these are vital programs. But in our family, the act of marriage saved our family. It was the abuse of alcohol that caused the havoc and the chaos. And so I react probably more viscerally than most people when I look to see that as state policy, New Hampshire is in the position of offending the institution of marriage while letting alcohol abuse off scot-free. And I want to fix that because I believe the messages that we send as a state legislature at some level matter. Okay, uh, Representative Edwards, I, I, you know I agreed with you last term and the term before on this issue. Yes, sir. Uh, but um, but I, I'm just, uh, it's a procedural question. We do have the governor's budget uh, person in with us tomorrow. And we'll, we'll probe on this one to see what the, the intention of the of the governor was about the four hundred eighty-two million a uh, thousand dollars a year uh, going forward, or you know, for the next two years anyway. Yes, and sir. We'll go from there. I think we'll have a little more knowledge after tomorrow's meeting with the governor's budget fellow, uh, director. Representative Janine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Edwards, in in principle, I uh, th this. Uh, uh, Bill is new to me being new to ways and means. So in general, I look at this, I, I agree with what you're trying to accomplish here. It makes sense not to make it look like marriage is, is the offending situation. And the alcohol fund does make sense to me. Um, why not to, I, I've heard a lot of uncertainty expressed from different representatives um, as, and we none of us can predict the future. So why not come back with an amendment on this where you, where you introduce, you know, kind of swap out, so to speak, the marriage um, fee with an alcohol fee. And that way you don't have to go through multiple steps to get there and you can eliminate the uncertainty that many are concerned with. That's a good question. Um, because you were not in ways and means last term, you were spared the two or three times where I, I held forth on this issue uh, in a in front of a very patient committee um, in August uh, when we were uh, had our bill period opened. Um, uh, I had no clue if I was going to get reelected, let alone uh, get the assignments that I've received. So I put a bill in in August to keep this issue alive. And it was after my assignments and after some committee meetings where I thought, oh man, there's a lot cleaner way to do this than what my underlying bill 346 did. So I submitted an amendment that would make 346 
cleaner and easier and get rid of an extraneous idea. Now, you're, you're, if you are, as a committee, uh, wanting to kill 346 and the amendment with it, I'll just keep coming back. I'll, I'll figure out more. I'll, I, I will work this until I'm convinced that I've been able to convince enough people that this is a is a good and right thing to do, and that and that procedurally it's all okay. Thank you, Representative Tucker. Yes, I I too uh, find that the idea of fixing something that's not broken is very hard to understand. What we do know is that it appears that the incidences of domestic violence have risen during the pandemic as people uh, are forced to spend a lot more time with each other, which sometimes unfortunately does lead to violence and abuse of various kinds, whether physical or verbal, psychological. This doesn't seem to be the time to be changing funding or leaving a bridge into an unknown. We know that domestic violence is a problem right now, that it's a rising problem in the pandemic. I don't believe this is the time to have a change. Let's leave well enough alone, make sure that this program has funding, that there's no temptation once it's in the general fund not to spend it because it, we are facing many uncertainties. Let's leave certainty in the funding of domestic violence. If you're able to identify a better source, another year, <clears throat> I think that's fine. Then we can that's discuss one question. Well, I want to know how you react to that. I, I react by um, saying that a major part of what you said in your question to me is uh, not relevant to the amendment I've put before you. My amendment fully 100% funds domestic violence programs. Uh, I think in a way it's better than the current law because the current law uh, assumes approximately 122,000 from marriage officiates uh, licenses that we don't know if that's coming in. And I'm offering you a guarantee of fully funding this at the governor's level. And so I just don't want anyone to mishear and think that I want anything to do with cutting domestic violence programs because I do not, I want them fully funded. So, um, so to your other point though, about it not being broken, that's a difference of value systems. My value system says it's broken, yours does not. Um, and that's, that's okay. That's why you know, we all get elected to come represent our people. Thank you. Representative Ames. Yes. Thank you. Um, good morning, Representative Edwards. Uh, so this question relates to the suggestion that this program, domestic violence program, uh, might better be funded from the alcohol fund. And um, my question to you is, uh, is this, uh, do you have information on the proportion of domestic violence that is occasioned by um, alcohol abuse or more broadly substance abuse? So, so that's a great question. And I spent a lot of time on the national and local websites trying to look for statistics of different types and a statistic I wanted to validate was what I heard in uh, Health and Human Services two terms ago that 70%, 70% of all domestic violence occurs between unmarried partners. Unfortunately, on the website, uh, they only use the term of art intimate partners and make no effort to distinguish between marriage and, and uh, unmarried uh, uh, domesticated couples. So, so, so that was one stat I really wanted to bring in here that's kind of buried and not exposed on the websites. The, 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 but to your specific question, 
uh, I also was looking to see um, if there was sort of a breakdown of factors that lead to domestic violence. You know, in my mind, I was thinking, well, maybe there's a pie chart out there somewhere that says, you know, X percent is related to drug abuse, Y percent is related to illegal dr uh, drug abuse, uh, another percent is related to um, you know, couples not having good role models to follow in, in their teen years. You know, I, but, but there are those, I can't find those statistics. And when I, I, when I got called about two weeks ago from a national lobbyist, I asked her for help finding these statistics and she said she'd call me back and, and uh, that just hasn't happened yet. So I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I can just tell you in my personal experience, um, both as a young man and as a company commander in the army, that the domestic violence that uh, I've seen is predominantly related to uh, 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 an incident following alcohol abuse. And, um, and I don't have the stats to back it up other than life experience. So. Um, so I'm sorry I can't do better than that, uh, Representative Baines. Okay, let's leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Major. Thank you, Representative Edwards, for taking my questions. Um, I do happen to have a pie chart of uh, victims' relationships to their abuser. Uh, the, the largest category is the spouse category. And um, I think we should acknowledge that there are other relationships beside, besides intimate um, where the abusers are not the intimate partner. They can be the father, mother, brother, sister, cousin, roommate. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different categories, but the largest category is the spouse. Um, my question though is, do you know of any complaints from people that are purchasing their marriage license about where their $43 is going? No, but I think that's because people have no clue. Uh, and I would love it if you would please provide your statistics with me because I, I'm telling you, I have been trying for a year to get my hands on statistics that would I will, answer I'll email, that. I'll email that to you. That would be great. I'd also be interested in who emailed it to you, but but that's a different um, issue. Well, it's the the New Hampshire Coalition of Domestic Violence, and I believe there's an attendee that wants to speak as well. Maybe they could raise their hand. Thank you. So I, I would add that I've not been contacted by the coalition, and uh, I did I did do an outreach effort through a, a friend of a friend. Um, I, I, I wanted to talk to them before today. Okay. Um, Representative Alamey. Thank you. Um, basically, I just wanted to uh, clarify something for Representative Abrami. Representative Edwards, uh, isn't it true that in the governor's budget that uh, 500 and whatever, it is, 400 and whatever it is, uh, is uh, going to show up as other funds, mainly that is coming from dedicated funds. And his budget contains all spending, whether it's from dedicated funds or, uh, or the highway fund or whatever. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. And I, I, I've tried to agree with that two or three times. And uh, the graphic is posted in my written testimony. Thank you. I, I know. I just wanted to make sure that uh, it was understood by the committee. Any further questions for Representative Edwards? I don't see any. Thank you, Representative Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will continue to listen in case there are uh, further questions for me later. Thank you. Okay. The next is a Sandra Plummer, who is a member of the public who wishes to testify in opposition. And I don't see a Sandra Plummer on the attendees list. However, I believe Pamela English is an attendee and wanted to testify, but she'll have to raise her hand if that's the case. 
Okay, you do not see uh, Sandra Plummer. I do not, no. Okay. And who is the one that you mentioned? Uh, she just raised her hand. Her name is Pamela English, and she's from the New Hampshire Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Is she on the list? She was not on the list, but she raised her hand. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I think if you asked Pamela Kalig, she would tell you that Sandra Plummer has had a emergency and could not come today. And I believe that Pamela English is substituting. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Pamela English. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Pamela English. Can you hear me? Yes, are you substituting for Sandra Plummer? Um, I'm sorry, but I'm not aware of who Sandra Plummer is. I am substituting for our executive director, Lynn Chalette, uh, who cannot be here today because her father just passed away. Okay, and you in opposition or supporting? I'm in opposition, sir. Okay, thank you. So good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am the administrative director of the New Hampshire Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I'm sure many of you are aware that the coalition is an umbrella agency for 13 community-based crisis centers in New Hampshire who provide free and confidential services to nearly 15,000 survivors of sexual and domestic violence every year. Um, I thank you again, but I'm also uh, sorry to hear that Representative Edwards has experienced domestic violence in his household growing up. This unfortunately is common in our state Programs work every day to protect victims and children who are far too often trapped in homes with abuse. We're also incredibly grateful to Representative Edwards for his commitment to providing funding to these life-saving programs. Just a little about the Domestic Violence Prevention Program. It was created in 1981 by the legislature and guaranteed a funding source for domestic violence programs. The program has supported tens of thousands of victims of domestic violence over the last 40 years. Moreover, nearly 30 other states provide domestic violence funding through marriage license fees. Um, as we talked about, currently $43 from marriage licenses and $80 from the new special efficient license goes towards the domestic violence prevention program. And that will bring nearly $500,000 annually that crisis centers can rely on from year to year. This is also a tax-free way to fund these valuable services. And although this bill provided an alternative funding source for domestic violence services, the suggested funding source lacks stability. And I'll get to more about the amendment, but originally there was parking tickets and fines they're not a stable source for domestic violence funding, nor is it an adequate replacement for what currently is provided. Um, according to the fiscal note, these alternative funding sources would cause programs to experience an almost total loss of funding as a result of the bill. So the Domestic Violence Prevention Program provides funding for core services for victims and their children across New Hampshire. These are critical life-saving services, including emergency shelter, services for traumatized children exposed to domestic violence, the operation of our 24-hour hotlines, and allows for trained and confidential domestic violence advocates to accompany victims to court proceedings and to hospital uh, visits. So it's critical that crisis centers can respond with the services they need and with a commitment to keeping victims and their children safe. Unfunded programs should never be the reason a survivor is denied access to safety. As you all acknowledged earlier, we remain under an unprecedented global pandemic that's created even more barriers for victims of abuse and their children. Over the last year, our crisis advocates reported that incidents of domestic violence had escalated to alarmingly lethal levels, an increased need for survivors to receive immediate interventions just to stay alive. Crisis centers experienced a 39% increase in calls to 24-hour hotlines, 
receiving nearly 100,000 calls for survivors in 2020. That's in New Hampshire. So advocates across the state report that the needs of survivors have become more complex as a direct result of the pandemic. Without the support of our services, many victims and their children would remain in, would remain trapped in abusive and dangerous homes. Crisis centers have had to turn away 3,500 adults and 2,000 children due to lack of capacity from 2017 to 2020. I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between, a marriage, between marriage and domestic violence. So we understand there's some concern expressed by the sponsor over the funding source and the connection between domestic violence and marriage. In preparation for this hearing, we were able to analyze data from the last five years, which we routinely use in grant reports. According to statewide data collected by our crisis centers over the last five years, 27% of victims of domestic violence served by our programs were in spousal relationships. I believe Representative um, Jenny, I'm sorry, I don't remember her last name, Germala maybe, um, talked about how it was the highest relationship type for reported domestic violence compared to all of the other relationship types. And that is true from what we see from our data. Uh, moreover, we know that marriage does not cause domestic violence, but it does make it a lot harder for some victims to leave because of legal obligations or religious commitment, children and joint assets and debt. And it's not surprising that we see more married people seeking help at our crisis centers. It's much easier to leave a relationship when you don't have those obligations. Similarly, alcohol does not cause abuse, but it can make domestic violence worse. Firearms do not cause domestic violence, but they do make the situation far more lethal. Domestic violence is a choice. Most abusers do not threaten to kill or slap their bosses or the police officer who pulls them over. They can manage their anger. They just choose to use violence and threats as a tactic to control and exert power over their partners and kids. So we urge this committee to vote HB 346 inexpedient to legislate and ensure that our state's crisis centers maintain this stable source of funding Mr. Chairman, speaking in addition to the sponsor's proposed amendment today, the state does not provide adequate funding for domestic violence services through the state budget. And the funding levels shifted dramatically over the past few budget cycles. The coalition and all 13 crisis centers would prefer to have this dedicated source of funding over these dollars being issued through the general fund because we've seen stark fluctuations in the general fund appropriation over the years, including one year in recent history when the legislature appropriated little more than $2,000 to domestic violence programming shared by 13 member programs, crisis centers serving 15,000 15, victims that year. So while we are extraordinarily grateful, we are grateful for Representative Edwards's commitment to increasing general fund dollars, as well as the extraordinary leadership of Governor Sununu and the current legislature's commitment to funding services, we cannot ensure that this will be the will of future legislatures as it has not been in the past. Victims of crime could certainly use an increase in general fund appropriations, but in addition to our general funding through the marriage licenses, which has been used successfully for the past 40 years. It is vital that crisis centers have this funding source that they can rely on. Thank you so very much. And I'm, I'm very happy to have take any questions. Mrs. Engel, uh, two things. Would you supply the committee a copy of your testimony? Yes, I shall. The other question is, on my list here, I have you listed as opposed, which you testify as opposed, but it lists you as not testifying. Was that a mistake or did you actually 
put now, you're not going to testify? Uh, it's quite possible that originally we did put me down as not testifying, but again, our, our executive director, uh, my boss, Lynn Chalette, who was going to testify, when was unable to do so because the, um, her father passed away yesterday. Okay, that explains it. But Thank if you. you. Would, if you would provide us that testimony, it would be appreciated. I, I intend to email that to you shortly. Okay. Representative Salford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for taking my question. A um, couple of things. Beyond the 500,000, um, I was curious in broad terms what your other funding were, um, sources were, and also um, are any of these things eligible for matching funds? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Representative. Um, we do have some federal funding through the Violence Against Women Act and through the Victims of Crime Act and through the Federal uh, Family Violence Prevention and Services Act. But uh, you mentioned match representative and those federal sources require a match in order us, for us to receive them. And uh, so there are as much as 25% of the federal funds. And we use the Domestic Violence Prevention Program because it is state general fund dollars as well as the marriage license fees uh, for the match for those programs. So that's another very strong argument to keep marriage license fees uh, as a stable source of funding for the Domestic Violence Prevention Program. Thank you. A quick follow-up. Follow up. So just an estimate of your total expenses when you add in all the others? Uh, total expenses for the coalition? Yes. Services for annually? Yes. Uh, it's we're, Since COVID, we've gotten s several other funds to assist with that. We're about $10 million. So that um, is, uh, so 500,000 is state, 500,000 other? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question, Representative. Was so was a million your total, including the five hundred thousand from the state? From the state, it's a little yeah. bit more than that, I believe, Representative. Yeah. I think it's about a million five. Okay, thank you. Did did you answer that your total expenses were ten million or one million? I'm sorry, are you asking, Representative? Um, I'm asking yes. uh, Representative English. Uh, Pam. All, yes, thank you. All of the coalition's funding, both federal and state and private, is um, about 10 million. But state funding is only uh, approximately <coughs> 2 million. And that's with COVID. Yeah, Correct. And, and before COVID, what was the funding? Total funding or just state funding? Total funding before COVID. Yes, that was about seven and a half million. Okay, thank you. Are you all set, Representative Alvarez? Yes, thank you. I was confused. <laughs> Representative Abrani. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Ms. English, for your testimony. Just a curiosity question. You know, we've heard anecdotally that uh, many marriages have been put on hold because of the virus. Um, how has this impacted the revenues uh, coming through these two programs? Well, Representative, I don't believe that the coalition is able to see the number of marriage licenses that were granted over the last several years. And I, I think that I would have to say, I also know that anecdotally and I'm not aware of data I get to to substantiate that. So I apologize for not having the answer. No, that, that's fine. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Doucette. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for taking my question. I just, uh, personal curiosity, you mentioned a couple of times there's 13 crisis centers. Could you tell me, uh, tell the committee where, where in the state those centers are located? Yes, I certainly can. Um, they are located in Berlin. I'm going to do this from memory. So uh, Berlin, Littleton, Plymouth, Lebanon, uh, Hanover, no, Claremont, I'm sorry, Claremont. Some of them have uh, 
satellite offices, um, Portsmouth, Nashua, Manchester, Concord, Laconia, and Conway. I might have gotten 13. Keen. Did I? And when you provide us your other testimony, if you can provide us that list, that would be great. I certainly can. We, we can provide you a map that shows you, uh, a map of New Hampshire that shows you the catchment areas of the crisis centers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any further questions of Mrs. English? I don't see any. Uh, Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. English, uh, I did understand you to be defending the logic of uh, drawing from marriage licenses, but I think your emphasis was on the need for dedicated funds. So my question is, if we retained this and an amendment was brought forward that made a direct substitution of a reliable source of dedicated funds, would you then drop your opposition? Thank you for your question, Representative. I don't know that we would, only because as Representative Tucker and I believe Almi mentioned, this has been a stable source of funding for almost 40 years. And we would be concerned on a couple of levels that it could take away funding from other very needed services in, the, in New Hampshire, such as, for instance, the opioid addiction that would come from the drug and alcohol fund and those types of um, very important services. So um, we would be hesitant on that note. And it is a small amount and it is spread out among 15,000 victims per year, but it, it is an amount that we can pretty much count on. It, and I think that we would certainly look at whatever the committees or the legislature would offer but I don't think I could say definitively today, Representative, that we would not be in opposition of, of a change. My goodness, we've experienced a lot of change over the last year, haven't we all? <laughs> Thank you, I understand your concern. Thank you very much. Uh, further questions from the committee? And the attendees, better check that. I don't see any hands raised. <clears throat> now the sign up sheet has 18 signed up in support of the bill and 121 signed up in opposition to the bill. I'm not going to go through and read the list, uh, but it's available. Any further questions or comments on House Bill? 346. If not, then I'm going to close the hearing on 346 and we will be discussing it again when we meet on March 2nd. Let me just catch up on that. We have three more bills, but they're scheduled for one o'clock, one thirty, <clears throat> and two o'clock. So, seeing no further discussion, uh, the public hearing is over. Uh, does anybody have any questions in general? If not, then we will see you all back at one o'clock. Just mute your video and your audio. Thank you. Representative Major? Yes. Uh, you did get my email that I may be late. Yes, I did. Okay, thank you.
We seem to have a lot of people in panelists that are supposed to, oh, oh no, I see. Well, we only have 20, should have at least 25. <clears throat> and it is one o'clock. So are we all set your name? Yes, we are. There's no one signed up to speak. Uh, except for the speaker, uh, except for the sponsor. Is, there, is, Heron, is Representative Harrington here? Um, geez, did I see that? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 400, an act relative to the collection of sales tax of foreign jurisdictions by New Hampshire businesses. Representative Harrington? Thank you, Mr. Ch Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. This is a, a pretty straightforward uh, bill. I think most members are familiar with the Wayfair decision that was made a few years ago by the Supreme Court. It was a case brought by the state of South Dakota. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was a 5-4 decision. And basically, they changed the idea of physical presence in order to collect uh, sales tax. So, for example, uh, if some business in New Hampshire in the past, who had no physical presence, let's say in California, sold uh, items to a resident of California over the internet, there was no uh, uh, need to collect any sales tax uh, by the company in New Hampshire and remit that to California. This um, <coughs> Supreme Court decision, the Wayfair decision changed that, like I say, in a 5-4 decision, they came up with this virtual presence standard in which Justice Kennedy was the big purveyor of. Uh, he, he was the one who was really pushing this. And basically what it comes down to now is that if someone has a business in New Hampshire and they sell that same product to somebody in California, they have to collect the sales tax from the, the buyer and then remit that to the state of California. And for those who aren't familiar with it, there it's a lot more complicated than that statement just sounds, what I just said, because there's somewhere in the vicinity of 12,000 different sales tax in the United States. Uh, different rates, some places cities have them imposed on top of the state. Some products have them. Uh, some other products that are very similar don't. Um, I, if you look at Massachusetts, for example, if you buy, I think it's clothing up to two hundred dollars is no tax, but over two hundred dollars, there is a tax. Uh, certain things like charcoal is considered a fuel, so it's not taxed. Uh, there's, there's all these varieties and it's almost impossible for anyone to keep up with it without. I guess you'd have to hire some outside company whose expertise was doing that. But my point is, and the reason I put this forward was, as most of you are aware, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of activity around this and there was meetings and so forth, and, but nothing really happened. What has happened since then is a lot of the states have followed the so-called uh, South uh, Dakota example, which it could be a little bit off on the numbers here, but I think they say if this company in, say, New Hampshire, if you do make less than 200 sales to individuals from South Dakota in a given year, and the total value is less than $100,000, then you don't have to bother with the tax. But nevertheless, if you go over those amounts, you do. Some states have followed that. Other states are still working on it. But the reason I put this forward is because, I mean, the bill is pretty pretty straightforward. It says, nor the inhabitants of this state controllable by any other laws than those to which they or the representative body have given consent. Therefore, New Hampshire business, no New Hampshire business retailer should be required to collect sales or use tax for a foreign government or provide any information on the facilitation of collecting these tax unless such collection is mandated by the Congress of the United States in accordance with the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the United States Constitution. The attorney general of the state of New Hampshire shall defend this law in all jurisdictions where it's challenged. And this puts forward the New Hampshire Constitution. And I might also add that, like I said, Kennedy, Justice Kennedy was one of the per he was the person pushing this. And he's gone, obviously. Uh, Justice Ginsburg is gone. 
So of the five justices who voted in favor of it, uh, is only three left. And I obviously don't know how the new justices would vote on it, but I would think it would be difficult if this was to get to the Supreme Court for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule that the New Hampshire Constitution was that was enacted prior to the federal Constitution was unconstitutional. And I just don't see them doing that. And that's the reason for putting in the uh, the uh, attorney general shall defend the law because I don't want them going after individual companies and, and try to take them. I don't even know what court they take them to, uh, maybe federal court or state court in another state. But the fact is our constitution is very, very clear on this. And we never, the people of New Hampshire never elected the Supreme Court, nor did they elect the representatives from South uh, Dakota or Massachusetts or California or any other state. So our constitution says, they will not be required to follow those laws. And the only case where it would come in is under the federal constitution, which clearly gives the power to regulate interstate trade under the Commerce Clause to Congress of the United States. So I think this is what our constitution says. It just simply codifies it. And I'll be willing to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Harrington. Um, Representative Bromley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Harrington. Uh, good to see, good hearing from you. So, you know, we spent a lot of time on this on this issue over two sessions, uh, two two years worth. Um, there was a joint committee with the Senate. Uh, we had the Governor's Council um, involved in drafting language. The goal of what we came out with, which is in place now, is that. <clears throat> Yes, it, yes, the only way we can resolve this is going back to the Supreme Court, but the trick is to be able to get the Supreme Court to take the case. And the counsel that we got was, you gotta be careful about that. You, you just can't say, well, we disagree with the Supreme Court and, and, <clears throat> and think they're gonna take the case. So uh, yes, th this has never been ruled on under, under the Commerce Clause. Uh, that's probably the avenue eventually, but it's our understanding that from um, talking to DRA just the other day, uh, for everybody, there have not been that many uh, inquiries. The way our bill, uh, all the current law works now is that um, companies that are being reached uh, out by from other states asking them to collect the, the, the tax, um, we have not gotten many referrals from other states or other companies uh, about that. So uh, I just want to make sure you, you aware of that that it's it's been pretty calm since since our work of a couple of years ago. Uh, are you aware of that? Yes, yes, I am aware of that. I think probably a lot of that has to do with the COVID situation. That that's everything else has been put on the back burner. So I'd kind of like to take advantage of that. And I realize what was done there and that we haven't seen a big push. But I think once things start to get back to normal, some things won't. And that's, I think, this huge increase in the use of the Internet. And these other states are just going to look out there and just say there's too many tax dollars we're losing. And I think you'll see that uh, that process accelerating as, as far as getting to the Supreme Court. I agree uh, it could be a long process, but. Again, I'm an engineer, not a lawyer, so this is just my best thoughts, and that's that by having the attorney general defend it, they could have the state of New Hampshire challenge, you know, if there was business A in New Hampshire being taken to court by the state of California, then the state of New Hampshire could step in and challenge the uh, state of California, which would then get primary jurisdiction to the Supreme Court if it's one state going after another state. That would be, I, I guess, the most uh, efficient way to get there if, if that can be done. But I realize it's, it's never easy going through the courts, but I just think it gives a venue. We have a constitution that's been there for you know over 200 years. It's very, very clear what it says. This isn't ambiguous. And I think as representatives from the state of New Hampshire, we ought to be defending that constitution and saying we will protect our companies uh, under, that, under that provision of the constitution, which says you can't do it to them. All right, well, I'll let this go for now, but uh, we may be hearing from the Attorney General who's in charge of this now, uh, hopefully. And if we do have a hearing, I'll, I'll make you aware of, of that hearing or work session on this bill in which he would testify if he's not testifying today. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it because 
if you know how to get in touch with someone at the attorney general's office, you must have much better connections than I do, because I've been trying for a while on this issue and other issues. And I send emails and get no response. And if you call, you simply get a tape saying um, our mailbox is full, go away. And there's no way to even leave a message. So if you well, can get through to them, let me know. Well, our goal is to get an update as to where we're at. OK, but we, we heard through the DRA that. Uh, that the, the, the amount of activity is minimal yeah. uh, of what's going on in this. So I'll let that go. Uh, there's Thank others you. have questions. Thank you. Representative Ames. Thank you. Um, and picking up on Representative Abrami's uh, points and background information. Um, first, uh, we, we did enact substantial legislation after some hiccups along the road, uh, have, involving a special session once during the summer, and then we tried again and we got through it and uh, reformed the bill and, and put in place legislation to set the attorney general sort of in a uh, position where um, that office would monitor what's going on and uh, recommend actions or perhaps even take legal actions unilaterally uh, for the state. Um, and we set up a commission uh, to uh, review what was going on. The attorney general was part of that, the attorney general's designee. Uh, I was on it. I don't know whether Representative Abrami was there. I don't remember. Um, and, uh, and it was chaired by Senator Morse and COVID got in the way. So uh, it never... It never reached the point of making the recommendations, so far as I know, uh, that were called for by the statute, and now it's expired. Um, and it would make, I wonder, uh, Representative Harrington, if it uh, might make more sense rather than just sort of go for the, the bottom line, as your bill does, um, it would make more sense to revive that commission. I'm not recommending this, I'm really asking, um, so that the key actors, the attorney general, who you've had a hard time getting in touch with, for example, and uh, uh, Senate leaders and House leaders could uh, um, hear the latest information of what's going on nationwide and in New Hampshire, and uh, take considered action based on that. And as you know, I think, uh, well, as you know, the uh, uh, this kind of legal action is is costly, and for a small state like New Hampshire to take the lead um, uh, is a, a step that has to be based on on uh, something really sound. Um, so my question is uh, is about uh, taking a different route than than your bill. Well, thank you for your question. I, I would suggest that we take multiple routes in that I guess the best way to describe, at least in my opinion, what was done uh, over that special session and so forth is we put hurdles up that made it more difficult for a another state to force someone to collect sales tax business in New Hampshire. We didn't prevent it. We just made it more difficult. They had to jump through a few hoops here and file things here and do this. But my proposal is not a hurdle. It's a roadblock it would stop them and say, you can't do it. And I will still come back always to the oath that we all took, which says we're supposed to defend and uphold the constitution. This is what the constitution says, and we should be defending and upholding it. But that doesn't mean we can't take alternate approaches as well. I mean, we hit them with everything we got as far as I'm concerned. If there's other ways to, to make it more difficult for doing it, uh, let's go for it. But I think we have that obligation to uphold the rights of the people of New Hampshire. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Harrington, uh, Representative Ames, idea of, of the commission, would you be against that? No. I'm sorry. I lost. I don't know if anyone can hear me, but I can't hear you. Okay. Let me oh. try again. Uh, let me make sure my audio is on. Now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Okay. Representative Ames' suggestion of having a commission reenacted, would you object to um, having this changed into a commission? 
Well, I mean, if it would be a, a question of, and we have to be realistic about things, obviously, if it's, if it's a question of not getting this passed or changing it to a commission, I would certainly consider that as a, as a way to go down that road. I just think we need to be doing, we need to be doing something. And if we have a commission, that would be certainly better than having just have this bill killed. So, I mean, I'm going to be a realist. I've been around long enough, Norm, you know that. You got to, there's no sense in just going in with dreams because that gets you nowhere. Thank you. Representative Elliott. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my thought is that uh, there is no need for this bill uh, that, that I'm aware of, and there's no motion uh, from Representative Harrington. Uh, is it your intention that we ought to pass this today or because uh, I don't think it'll pass. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought this was just a public hearing and it, not the executive it, it, session. Questions, Representative Elliott. Say that again? If you have a question. Of yes, what is, what is Representative Harrington a motion? I know it's a public hearing, but what's, what's gonna be his motion to pass this? Uh, well, I would- uh, He doesn't make that motion, it's the committee that makes yeah. the motion. I'm just here as the bill sponsor. I, I don't have the authority to make a motion one way or the other in ways and means. Oh, okay. I get it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Harrington, we went through an awful lot of testimony and we worked very closely with Governor Sununu's legal counsel, who is an extremely capable individual and with the Attorney General's office, they all assured us that we were not going to be able to get something like this in without being sued and losing in federal court unless we want to secede from the United States. Uh, I realize you think that maybe SCOTUS would change their minds, but on wouldn't it, um, the commission was not working when it died because on um, the person in charge of it was from the Senate, was the original author of the bill and um, did, could not get people to show up from the attorney. The attorney general's office frequently had problems with showing up because the time that was picked was sometime when they were in tri trials. Um, and um, we were not getting frequent participation from uh, the DRA did come, the uh, business and economic affairs did not quite frequently. Um, but we did get information, as you said, that nobody, uh, very, very few, if any, you, I believe it was if any people had actually complained that they had been taxed by this. We did know that places are already paying and have been paying before this all blew up um, to avoid having to do lawsuits with other states. So would you, um, a commission that started from the house probably could get further with this if, and my, so my question is, would you mind us turning it into a commission again? Well, thank you for the question. And let me just, let me answer it in two parts. I still think, you know, you said that uh, it wouldn't be upheld in court, but I think we still have an obligation because it's a right defined in our constitution and we ought to be defending that. That's, that's one of the jobs that we have uh, is to uphold the rights that are defined in the New Hampshire state constitution. And this is clearly defined in there. And this, uh, the Supreme Court ruling is a violation of that. So I think we have an obligation to do that. But having said that, as I said to the chairman, one has to be realistic too. And to have this, uh, you know, get voted down 15 to five or whatever uh, and go nowhere is not accomplishing anything. So if it's in the wisdom of the committee, they think in order for this to move forward, we need to reestablish that commission. I, I could I could live with that. It's not my first preference, but it's certainly better than having this the bill just defeated and go away. Because I do realize it's been hasn't been happening that much, but I think come this summer, next fall, when things get back to normal, and the the uh, 
Amazon trucks are still rolling all over the world like they are now, there's going to be much more push on uh, these other states to start collecting that sales tax. Any other questions from the committee? Let me look at the sign-up sheet. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Harrington. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have, I have only one person that signed up. It's a Glenn Brackett, who represents the lobbyists from the working people of the New Hampshire AFL-CIO their opposition and they do not want to testify. Once again, anybody else wish to testify for or against House Bill 400? Look at the attendees. Nobody from the attendees. I don't say. No. So, somebody say something? I just said no, Representative Major. No attendees have their hands raised. All right, then I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 400. The next bill is scheduled for 1.30. It is 1.21. Uh, would we be out of order if we discuss House Bill 400 now as a committee? It, it isn't. It hasn't been uh, put in the calendar as a work session. Yeah. Well, no, my 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 opinion is that uh, uh, this just brought up Wayfair again, uh, and that you know maybe we should hear hopefully before we we vote on this bill that we can get the AG. Uh, I know we have the, the name of the specific person that we have to contact to come and explain exactly where we are right now, just as an update to us. Okay. Nothing to do with the bill in a way, but indirectly, yes, with the bill. You know, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. I'll, I'll get a hold of it. I, I think you'd have to be sure to, to get him during a time he was available. That's been one of the big problems. They go off to court all the time. Uh, I'll get from my from my for Miller a call and see if he's available on the second. Because he's the one we really want to talk to. Who, for Miller? For Miller. The governor's counsel? No, 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 he's the attorney that- Oh, okay. No, I think, I think uh, to clarify, John Formella uh, at that time, and I think, think still, although I don't know for sure, was the governor's legal counsel. Right. And, it, and he was, uh, and from the attorney general's side, there were various people that came to talk with us. At one point, Bill Ardinger was there wearing uh, some kind of consultant hat to, to the attorney general and uh, very much involved in the redrafting of the bill. So I think uh, Formella, yes, but he's probably not engaged right now on this issue. And, there is uh, probably an assistant attorney general who has the assignment. I'm sure he has the right person. Well, Norm, Norm uh, I think yeah. Carolyn Lear sent us a note um, uh, on a name. She, she sent us a name of somebody from, uh, that she deals with all the time uh, uh, from the AJ's office that she thinks is the right person. So I, I, I printed that email out, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you offline uh, about who okay. that is. Yeah. Yeah. So I just like to point out that one of the things that was in what we passed was that the DRA and the AG's office would be cooperating on finding people who were upset at being being taxed in this way. And certainly when they're being taxed retroactively, it's very difficult. No, I, I found that email. We can review that uh, work session on the second and see where we want to proceed based upon their input. Norm, it's Pat again. Um, yeah, I found an email. Um, the name of the attorney, Samuel Garland. She yes. suggests that we speak to That's Samuel. the same one as last time. Okay. Yes. All right. She's been talking to him about this and other things on and off, so. I'd like to point out that there has been uh, all of the states 
that have started collecting this, and most of them have, have experienced large increases in their sales tax revenues. And there is no way they're going to give that up without a fight. That is right. So we have six more minutes. We have a hand up. Uh, Representative Hack and Phillips. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to bring up um, a side comment about this, given the fact that the work session is scheduled for the 2nd of March. I probably have a professional conflict that day where I'll, I too will be in court. And uh, I just wanted to weigh in with a little bit of my concern that uh, you know the cost of litigation at the Supreme Court level is exorbitant. And I'm not sure that that is a prudent fiscal determination to make in such a year where we're already worried about a healthcare crisis, um, as well as, you know, budget revenues. And uh, I just, I'm not sure that that is a prudent um, cause of action for the state to be endeavoring at this time. Thank you for your input. Uh, anybody else? It, may I just follow up by saying, <clears throat> yes. beyond the fiscal concerns, I am deeply concerned about the constitutionality of bringing this case. So um, on its merits alone, I also have concerns, but I think um, from a budgetary perspective, um, I just wanted to weigh in on both there. You will be available on the second. I'm not sure yet. I'm trying to determine if um, I have someone who might be able to fill in for me. So. Um, it sounds like you, know, you should hear what the attorney has to say. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any other comments? This is an important issue for the state. So we've been fighting this for many, many years. And Representative Major has been fighting it, I think, for about 18 years. I joined him since 2000 10 years ago. I, I knew all the uh, people involved, but some of them are passed away. Now. <laughs> Representative Janigian has his hand up. And before we go to Janigian, is that you have to realize there's only five states that don't that doesn't have a, a sales tax, and they're all five small states. Oh, and as far as going to Congress to get legislation to help us out, that isn't going to happen. Well, the biggest majority we have is two senators. I mean, we could have 10 senators out of 90. But in the House, out of 535 members, we may have a dozen. So the only way we're going to do when is to somehow get it through the courts. And three of those states have allowed their big cities to collect sales taxes. Yes. So we're unique because we're the only state without a broad-based tax, income or sales. So anyway, it is not, whoops, not quite yet ready. Got one more, you got another hand up now. Okay, Pat. Not me, uh, John. Oh, John. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that, John. No, no problem. Uh, I guess first a question. I mean, if is what I'm understanding from the law side of this, are people saying that if we pass this, it'll automatically trigger a challenge and it'll end up in the Supreme Court? I'm not sure. That's a question for a lawyer in the group. I mean, is that what people are saying, that if we pass this, we're automatically going to be challenged and it's going to go to Supreme Court? How about uh, Ames or Ames you're, Phillips? You're asking whether Mr. Harrington's suggestion would end us up in the Supreme Court? Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, let me first weigh in, and then maybe Dick, you can weigh in. I know you were real close to this as well. Yeah, Dick. yeah. It would certainly, it would certainly trigger something by the other states against us, and it is going to be. Uh, but that's not the way we wanted it to happen. We wanted to pick our battle if there was ever to be a battle in a situation where we actually had a chance of winning and doing it this way wasn't 
there was a lot of conversation around this and that our approach, we felt that the approach that's in place right now is the approach. Um, we fend it off. It seems, okay, maybe it's because of the virus. I don't know. Uh, so far we fended off these states. Yeah. Uh, they're not, they're not banging their doors down, but I, I think, I think we got to do this in a more like we did. We came up with a very systematic way of approaching this. But, but the question, the question was, if we pass this, will we end up with the Supreme Court? You know, I, I guess my response would be that uh, um, one never knows. Um, this would be, um, you know, on its face, a um, rejection of federal authority that probably wouldn't stand anyway. A, a challenge could well be, would likely be successful, I would say. But uh, the fact that it's on the st our statute books just sitting there doesn't necessarily mean that it will lead to litigation. Um, but if there was a company that refused to pay the uh, tax of California, say, or whatever, uh, like Wayfair did, um, then you've got a case. You've got uh, uh, harm. You've got the uh, a real case or controversy as it's put in the uh, law that uh, provides a basis for uh, legal action and review. So I, 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 I would doubt that just having it on our books would uh, by itself lead to something. So it almost sounds like there's no way for the state of New Hampshire to protect our businesses from this. I mean, even if we said we'll fight for any business that gets sued, um, we're still gonna end up in at the Supreme Court potentially and lose. I mean, well, we might win. I, I shouldn't have said it categorically. Who knows? Uh, you know, as someone pointed out, it's a different Supreme Court than it was. Uh, I think Representative Harrington pointed that out. Yeah. It's different, different membership. So you never know. Uh, and you never know whether uh, justices will rethink the situation. Uh, constitutional law is a moving target. We might have an argument based on the Commerce Clause. And that's a biggest yeah. argument. Anyway. So all the Supreme Court did was it, it it sent it sent it back down to the South Carolina uh, South Carolina South Dakota courts to deal with again. I think if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, Representative Ames, I think that's what happened. They, they, that is what happened, and then uh, the South Dakota courts vacated the case. Right. They said there's nothing more to argue about. Yeah. So that was that was the end of that. Could I could I just quickly add in on um, we've got. Uh, what we were going after was the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, set up a number of things as recommendations, essentially, in their decision. Both the people who voted against and the people who voted for said, said if you're going to do this, you have to, to put in a reasonable floor for how much sales tax is being uh, being requested from one state on. That is, you cannot go after a state for under a hundred thousand dollars worth of sales that you are taxing on. And they had a number of other conditions like that in there that meant that a small business, which has more trouble uh, dealing with 10,000 jurisdictions of sales tax places on was going to be protected against being told that they have to, to figure out a way to, to find out what Oakland, California resident who is buying their pot is, is going to have to pay in sales tax and figure out how to send it to Oakland, California. I'm going to have to stop this. Yeah, thank you. And open the public hearing on House Bill 504. And House Bill 504 is an act relative to the state education property tax and the low and moderate income homeowners property tax relief program. And the prime sponsor is Richard Ames and Representative Ames. Thank you. Um... And uh, I am here to, uh, to introduce House Bill 504. 
um, and it's, I feel privileged to, to be able to do so. Um, I, I want to note at the outset that I have, I think, coming up to speak behind me, uh, Representative Luno, uh, who chaired the School Funding Com uh, Commission, and uh, William Ardinger, who was also a member of that commission, and uh, Marjorie Porter, Representative Porter, um, and Jeff McLynch of the School Funding Commission. So uh, I'm going to try to be quick, um, although this is complicated. Um, and then allow time for these others. And there are others as well who uh, I, I think want to speak. I'm sure some will be speaking in opposition. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this bill is, uh, it really has, has two pieces to it that go together, that interrelate with one another. One is a reform of the statewide education property tax. And the other is a, a, a reform of the existing low to moderate income homeowners property tax relief program. Um, the two come together and I'll try to explain how. And there's a third feature of it, which calls for a study of certain issues that aren't uh, addressed immediately by these two other reforms. Um, looking at the bill, if you looked at it, oh, maybe I should back up. I sent, I sent to all members of Ways and Means uh, uh, some documents. I'm, I'm working off of those documents here. Yes. One was a uh, three-page document. Um, the first page, a three-and-a-half-page document, I think. The first page is key elements of House Bill 504. Um, the second page is a chart that shows certain uh, impacts, changes that result from, that would result if this bill were, could be enacted. And the last, uh, the page three to four, is a brief history of the statewide education property tax, which we colloquially refer to as SWEPT. Um, and then I also sent to you a couple of spreadsheets to try to illustrate the uh, impacts of uh, these changes, both the um, <coughs> property tax relief piece and the other uh, piece, which is reform of SWEPT. Uh, using uh, both the towns that uh, produce so-called excess swept, and I'll get to that, and uh, another set of towns that uh, I, I called comparator towns um, that uh, uh, will be impacted by these reforms in different ways. Uh, so you've got all those materials. I hope you got a chance to look at them. I'm not gonna go through them in detail right now, obviously, because time doesn't permit it. Um, so two components to this bill, a SWEP reform and property tax relief. Um, pages one and two of the bill uh, through to line 27 on page two are the SWEP reform changes. Pages uh, two uh, to four are the um, property tax relief program reform changes on the, uh, at the end of the bill is the study committee. Um, on the SWEP reform. First thing to say is there's no change in this bill in the SWEPT rate, in the statewide education property tax rate. That's figured under current law as the rate that will raise $360 million when applied against the taxable statewide property tax base, which excludes uh, utilities and railroads. And it excludes those as we discussed, I think yesterday, because those are taxed by the state um, under two other taxes. Um, so no change in the rate whatsoever. The rate floats um, and uh, it's going down because it takes less money, less a lower rate nowadays to raise $360 million than it used to take because property values are going up. Um, so that's the rate. Um, the, the, ch the big change is that it remits the bill would change where the swept revenues go to. It would still be collected by the municipalities as it is now. They do the billing. They'd receive a warrant from the commissioner of the Department of Revenue Administration identifying the, the uh, amount of money that they needed to raise by applying uh, the, the tax to their residents and uh, 
and the rate at an equalized level um, in this current year is down to 1.875. Uh, it used to be, uh, it was 1.925 last year and 2.060 the year before. Uh, so the, the, the warrant comes in, the uh, local uh, locality sends out the bill, collects the tax, um, the tax comes in, the money comes in, the money then is sent over by the municipality to uh, the school system um, for school expenditures. Um, the, uh, under the law, the purpose of this tax is to raise money for the adequate education formula funding. And uh, in most states, it's, it's not sufficient to fully fund that. So most school districts receive the money from the um, from the municipality and then get additional grants from the state, from the Education Trust Fund to fill out the adequacy commitment. Um, but there are 33 uh, cities and towns today that um, where the, uh, the swept amount exceeds the education uh, adequacy calculated amount and those are the so-called excess swept towns. Right now, that excess swept money for most of these uh, excess swept towns um, goes then towards other school expenditures that are not uh, that are above the adequate education amount. Um, there are there are seventeen excep exceptions to that. They're all uh, townships. Um, they receive. Uh, the sweat, they collect the sweat money just like uh, everybody else, but they don't have any education expenses, these 17 that I'm talking about. And so in that case, I believe the money goes to offset other municipal or county expenditures. Um, it's uh, not for education at all. That's the excess swept. Um, and under the bill, that would no longer be retained locally. It would go, all swept collections would go after uh, netting out the cost of collection and the cost of promoting the property tax relief program, the municip mun municipalities would send all of the money to the uh, Department of Revenue Administration for deposit into the Education Trust Fund. So that's the change there. Uh, that that uh, the money so sent would include this excess SWEP money that I've just spoken about, which totals today about $26 million. Um, that's the SWEP reform side. You turn to the low and moderate homeowners property tax relief program. Um, DRA would continue to administer that program. It's an existing program, as you probably all know, um, administered today by the DRA, uh, and the DRA would continue to administer it, but it would be a much more generous program. Um, the, uh, the relief that would be available, and I'll get to that in a minute, the, the formulas, but uh, the, the relief um, would be uh, capped at $25 million statewide, which uh, is about equal to that 25 or $26 million excess swept figure that I mentioned uh, uh, just a few minutes ago or a short time ago. Um, and uh, so the reform is fully paid for by that excess swept money. Um, the, uh, the relief is calculated by applying uh, not just the statewide education property tax rate, but also the local school tax rate combined against uh, the, homo the uh, homeowner's property value up to but not above $150,000. The current limit is $100,000. So we'd have a, a rate that would be the roughly $2 of the uh, swept, uh, for the swept, and uh, then whatever the local school tax rate is, which varies from, in some mostly excess swept towns, uh, in the $2 range all the way up to um, well, you know, um, $18, sometimes more than that for the uh, education property type, the local school tax side of the uh, rate. Um, 
So that entire rate would be applied against the $150,000. And the, for the poorest homeowner, the, the result of that calculation would be the relief available, except that it would be capped at $1,000 for any particular claimant. Um, and the uh, eligibility for this uh, relief, um, the numbers are in the bill. I don't think I can go through them, but it would start at $20,000. If you're below $20,000 and you're single and you have a home um, that's worth more than $150,000, the relief you'd get would be, um, would be the, uh, the rate in your town times the $150,000, it'd be 100% of that calculation. Um, if you had income above $20,000, but were below the, uh, the top level of $55,000, you'd get some relief. The relief would go down as your income went up. Basically, uh, there would be a slope down of relief as your income went up to the cutoff point for that single person. And there are different numbers for, for married people. Um, substantial relief way above what is currently available under the existing formula. Under the existing formula, the maximum relief to that uh, single person would be $187.50. Whereas in this, this bill, it would be a, uh, in the um, typical situation, it would be well above $1,000, but it'd be capped at $1,000. Um, and the last uh, note is that there is a study committee that the bill calls for, um, and that uh, study committee will um, look at some key, some very important questions. One is um, how to extend property relief effectively to tenants whose rents effectively reflect uh, high property tax rates. And uh, we need to figure that out and we need a committee to figure, help us figure that out. And then there's uh, the uh, property tax deferral program. The, the need and the potential of setting up a good uh, program for those homeowners who are in temporary circumstances and unable to pay their bill but need, need help uh, with a deferral system. So we need to figure that out as well. And then the third point is uh, data information that we in Ways and Means are acutely aware of the need for in the, in the property realm, DRA has an enormous amount of information on the, on, uh, that has built up over the years as they've uh, been assigned the responsibility of equalizing property values across the state. It's, the system is called Mosaic. And, uh, and we've looked, I've looked closely at that. I've tried to use it. Um, Representative uh, Luno, who's the tech guru of, um, for the legislature, I would say, but anyway, certainly for the School Funding Commission, uh, worked on it, uh, and uh, um, there were others that uh, have tried, but the, one of the problems is the categories aren't particularly useful into which the, uh, what you have to use are the categories that are used in Mosaic and they don't work very well. Um, so uh, that's, that's the bill as a whole, and I think I'd, I'd leave it there and hope that uh, we can move quickly to the other testifiers because I'm sure their schedules are tight just as ours are. Representative, thank you for your testimony, Representative, Representative Bryant, uh, Bromley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Ames. Um, this is indeed a complicated topic. Uh, um, I'm not an expert in it at all, but I, I live in the Portsmouth um, kind of general area and I see in the local papers uh, people in Portsmouth are calling this a return to donor towns because I think they get hurt by this. Can you, can you, is this, is, tell me, is this going back to donor towns or not? Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't present when you, uh, when that donor town controversy erupted. So, uh, so that's one point. Um, and um, I, I use the phrase excess swept towns rather than donor towns. Remember, there's no change in this bill in the rate. Um, so the, uh, we're not going up and in this bill proposing 
um, an increased collection of money. Um, this is a statewide, one thing I, I, I failed to mention is that this is a state tax. And uh, it's subject to constitutional provisions regarding uniformity and proportionality. Um, in the materials I gave you, the last page on the back of it, there's an extensive uh, excerpt from a decision by uh, the New Hampshire Superior Court in the Londonderry case. Um, and just to quote from it, uh, it uh, uh, the court in that case concluded that the, uh, uh, the bill before it, which was enacted, creates a non-uniform tax rate and the court finds that no constitutional justification can be articulated to permit the retention of those excess funds by the property rich municipalities. So I think the law says this is the way it has to be. Um, now that's not, I said that uh, too definitively, as I said when we were talking about Wayfair, um, you never know with constitutional law and how the court would come out, but I'd say the odds are that if this case gets to the Supreme Court, the excess swept component of the law uh, as it sits today would be thrown out. Um, and the other thing to say is that uh, we're talking about a relatively small amount of money and a very small property rate change for uh, the towns. You mentioned Portsmouth uh, uh, near you, I think is Newington. Um, Rye is not far away. Newcastle is not far away. They're all excess swept towns. They also have a, a very significant property tax base. In my chart, uh, in my chart, uh, I show uh, the differences in uh, in the median valuation per pupil, which is one way to sort of compare from one town to the next. For the excess swept towns, the median valuation per pupil is four point one million dollars. For the uh, cities and towns across the state, it's $1.1 million, huge difference. Um, the amount of education spending per pupil that the excess swept towns are able to manage is $28,000 per pupil. For the uh, towns across the state, it's about $17,500 uh, $17, per pupil. Um, big differences. So, uh, and if you, if you took the, the rates in those towns, the property rates towns, rates in those excess swept towns uh, for school expenditures and applied them against the higher value recess real estate that they have, the real estate there, it does cost more. Um, the actual tax paid by the typical homeowner is less than the actual tax paid by the typical homeowner in say Claremont or any other, any number of other, my own town, Jeffrey. Um, so uh, perhaps the donor town controversy will be reignited by this. I hope not. I hope that those towns will see that uh, it's a very small price that they they would pay for enabling a property tax relief program that will help their, their taxpayers as much as it helps anybody else in the state. And uh, without funding for this taxpayer relief program, it's not gonna happen. That's a long way to answer, I'm sorry. Well, let me say something about the donor town. When we passed the statewide property tax back in around 2000, it was a ta uh, an equalized value tax on property by the state and it was to, supposed to come into the state. But what the state did in their wisdom, they made a mistake, what they said is, Oh, you hold on to it in the towns and you can use it to pay the share of adequacy. And then uh, that sounded good. But then they found out there was a number of towns that they raised more than that. And so that the, the town says, wow, we, we don't want to give that away. That should belong to us. It should have been going to the state to provide adequacy for everybody in the state. We try to change that back probably a few years later and we got crammed because everybody came out of the woodwork. This is a donor town, it's not a donor town, but that's what's gonna happen when this bill 
goes through again. So, but I'm I'm with you on that. So, um, the next one is uh, you're all through Representative Bromley, and I don't see any other questions. So we go on to the. A Marjorie Porter. I think Representative Luno would be. Uh, Representative Luno? If he's available, if he's on. Uh, is Representative Luno, his name is not. Yes. yes, it is on the list, and I just promoted him. It is, okay. Is it? Okay. Uh, yep, I'm here. All right. I just just uh, just was invited in. So, um, Mr. Chair, is my audio okay? Oh, it's Luna, not you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your audio is fine. So we good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, and uh, I just want to say it's uh, it's really great to see Representative Elliot. We uh, miss him in the Education uh, Committee. So uh, so nice to be. Uh, be in front of um, you all, uh, albeit remote, this afternoon. Um, for the record, my name is Dave Luno, representing the people of Merrimack County District 10, which is the town of Hopkinton and the western part of uh, Concord. Um, as, um, as Representative Ames uh, said, I, uh, I chaired the school funding uh, commission, which released its final report back in December. And we'll actually be, uh, we've, in, we've invited all um, uh, senators and representatives to a briefing on this on, um, on Monday next week, Monday afternoon next week, and it's noticed in the calendar. So anyway, um, funding a public education continues to be an issue for New Hampshire and the subject of many court decisions and ongoing cases. The New Hampshire Supreme Court has long held that the responsibility to provide a constitutionally adequate education rests with the state. The School Funding Commission sees the objective of state fiscal policy as to ensure sufficient resources are available in every school district in order for all students in the state to have the opportunity for constitutionally adequate education. Well-designed fiscal policy should consider the full costs of educating students and recognize that fiscal capacity varies significantly among cities and towns and taxpayers and thoughtful consideration of fiscal policy for education involves many interlocking parts, all of which are important in improving student and taxpayer equity. The Granite State is much to be proud of when it comes to public education. New Hampshire is ranked third in the nation by US News and World Report, um, uh, uh, K-12 education rank rankings, calculated across metrics of college readiness, high school graduation rates, performance on the NAEP um, uh, math scores, uh, reading scores, and in preschool enrollment. Of course, averages don't tell the whole story. While New Hampshire's state average student outcomes are among the best in the country, that's not true for all school districts. Average performance by district falls over a wide range with some districts well above state average and others so far below average that it calls into question whether there was an opportunity for any students in those districts to access an adequate education. New Hampshire's average total uh, public school spending is in the top 20% of all states, um, uh, though its total spending per pupil is exceeded by several other New England states. However, the portion of the total spending comprised of state budget support is the lowest of all states. While the, while the low share of state budget support for public schools can contribute to student inequity across the state, it's not totally responsible for the lack of student equity. A principal culprit for student inequity is the method for allocating the state budget resources between poorer and wealthier districts. New Hampshire's current system of funding is not working for large segments of New Hampshire's students and taxpayers. Specifically, communities with higher poverty rates and lower property wealth are doubly penalized under New Hampshire's current system. Students in these communities, on average, receive fewer resources in the form of funding than students in wealthier communities. 
Taxpayers in these communities do their best to provide for their children, often levying higher local education property taxes than residents of wealthier communities. Inequities also manifest themselves in student outcomes. The negative relationship between districts, aggregated student outcomes and student poverty um, measured through, uh, through um, uh, uh, free and reduced price lunch um, uh, eligibility is clear and strikingly linear. As district poverty rates increase, student outcomes decrease. New Hampshire has, sig has significant variation across municipalities in the equalized property valuations used to generate the local revenue necessary to fund municipal and school budgets. The most property poor districts have an equalized property value per pupil of less than 400,000, while property wealthy districts have equalized property valuations in the millions of dollars. Property wealthy districts generate more revenue than property poor districts per dollar of property tax, of property tax rate. This means property poor districts have higher tax rates in order to generate the same revenue for schools as property wealthy districts. Some property poor districts have a local education property tax rate of more than $20 um, per thousand, while some property wealthy districts have an education property tax rate of less than $2 per thousand. New Hampshire also has significant variation in capacity to pay within municipalities, and the commission heard substantial testimony to that effect. For example, a homeowner in a property wealthy district may live on a fixed income and have limited financial resources when compared to others who live in that district. And the state's property tax relief program has outdated eligibility requirements, which limit its use right now. Compared to other states such as Massachusetts, New Hampshire's failure to direct resources to districts with limited fiscal capacity and provide effective property tax relief programs contributes significantly to student and taxpayer inequities. The state property tax was introduced in term. Uh, the state property tax was introduced in terms we would recognize today, uh, back in 1919, at a rate of three dollars and fifty cents per thousand. Over the years, the state property tax for various classes of property has been set at a rate between zero dollars per thousand and six dollars and sixty cents per thousand. In FY06, the legislature set a fixed amount of $363 million to be raised by the state property tax and let the rate float based on the amount to be raised divided by the statewide equalized property valuation. In FY20, the equalized property tax rate was $1.93 per thousand. Local education property taxes range from about 52 cents per thousand uh, in Hart's location to $24.02 per thousand in Charlestown. That means the owner of a $300,000 home in one community, um, which is pretty close to the state average in, uh, in New Hampshire, could pay the same amount, of, uh, same amount in property taxes as the owner of a $3 million home in another community. Nearly three quarters of New Hampshire state and local dollars raised for education come from property tax revenue. In 2000, a commission to analyze the economic impacts of various school funding revenue options was created by then Governor Shaheen. One, one takeaway from this uh, 2000 uh, report was that given the complexity of administering the property tax across hundreds of municipalities, New Hampshire would have to devote considerably more resources to administering the state property tax than it does so currently back in 2000, so that the fairness of the tax does not continue to be called into question or challenged in court. But subsequently, the constitutionally of the statewide education property tax was called into question, forming the basis of the plaint um, you know, styled as Sorrell versus State of New Hampshire. This is back in 1999. The court ruled the state property tax unconstitutional because the state did not have systems in place to provide equalized statewide property valuations outside of the local property tax jurisdictions. Following this decision, the general court made changes to how the state property tax was collected and used. Currently, the pro state property tax is collected locally and applied to the municipality's total cost of an education as determined by statute. 
If the amount of the state property tax collected exceeds this cost, the state issues an additional grant to the municipality in the amount of the excess with the stipulation that it be used for public education. By 2014, the DRA had implemented a comprehensive system called Mosaic to evaluate property sales and develop equalization ratios for all municipalities. Substantial testimony was heard by the commission, attesting to the efficacy of the system and fairness of equalized valuations. Representative Luna. Yep. Um, how much longer do you have? I can I can wrap this up, but it, this is you know the 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 I, I'm, I, I hate to bring yeah. We have ten other people want to testify. Okay. Okay, so um, if you want, to, if you have it uh, as a document, you could summarize I'll, it. Send I'll, it. I'll certainly summarize it and send it. Um, uh, I, I did want to just make a, make a quick example here since we're talking about excess swept and the state's changes um, uh, 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 to, to how uh, the state property tax is, is, is is done, but under under this bill, House Bill 504, um, uh, the the state property tax would be collected locally and sent um, in whole to the uh, to the state. And just as an example, um, uh, according to the DOE data, Portsmouth's cost of an adequate education is about ten million dollars. They raised twelve million from their state property tax. Based on their uh, their valuation, um, in order to raise that difference, two million dollar two million dollars through local property taxes, it would be thirty cents per thousand of valuation. So approximately three hundred dollars on a one million dollar home. And don't get me wrong, Mr. Chair, three hundred dollars is a lot of money, especially for people living on fixed incomes or moderate incomes. But that's exactly who House Bill five hundred four is designed to help. Um, and this example is well within the scope of the um, uh, tax relief. <laughs> bill. Uh, I'll wrap it up there and, uh, and happy to take any questions and to send, um, send this into uh, your clerk. <laughs> questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Elliott. Uh, mute yourself, unmute yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a question. I want to just say to David that I miss him too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> uh, any other questions? There isn't. So we will go on to the next. Uh, Thank you very much, Dave, Mr. Chairman. Do you have an option? Representative? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, Bill Ardinger would be next. Okay, Mr. Ardinger. If you would let him in. I am right now. And Mr. Adinger said he would take three minutes. Hello. You're on. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Bill. Very good. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. I will not be long. I wanna say first, um, for the record, my name is Bill Ardinger. I'm a tax attorney at a local law firm, Rath Young and Pignatelli. Our firm represents uh, many uh, businesses and also uh, lobbies, uh, members of our firm lobby. I am here not on behalf of any client, but on my own behalf. Anything I testify to, uh, I would ask the committee to recognize as my own opinion. It is not the opinion of any of our clients or um, of any other member of my firm. I would um, like to say that I'm here because I had the pleasure of serving as a member of the Education Funding Commission with um, Representative Ames, Representative Luno, and others. Uh, I was uh, the designee or the appointment of the governor of the state, and it was a very uh, positive experience. On this bill, which is about tax policy, I support it because I believe New Hampshire has not taken the steps yet that other states have taken 
to make the property tax system fairer for all property taxpayers who are subject to the tax. The commission's work concluded that the property tax is like any tax, nobody wants to pay a tax, but the property tax is a good tax to this extent. It is a stable tax. It provides resources that have, have been used to support the construction of our public school systems, which is, are the most important assets of our public sector. And, and the, the balance between a stable tax base and supporting um, important public assets like our common school system is, is very good for education policy. As a matter of tax policy, however, the property tax has flaws like every tax system. The property tax in sometimes applies to people of low income who don't have the regular cash flow that they can easily use to pay their tax liability. Representative Ames and House Bill 504 is, puts a, a spotlight on improving and fixing um, this problem with our current property tax system. The right way to provide protections to low income taxpayers is a direct and robust rule that applies directly to the intended taxpayers. The wrong way to provide protections to low income taxpayers is to protect one whole community under the name, which is a misnomer, donor town, which then protects not just low income taxpayers in that community, but protects very wealthy taxpayers who are perfectly able to pay their fair share of the obligation of supporting municipal needs and public schools. I would like to say that um, other aspect of this bill, which is to have the collection of the state property tax, um, the, all the proceeds remitted to the state treasury and then expended in accordance with a fairer uh, tax uh, distribution system that protects communities like Claremont, where I went to high school and met my wife at Stevens High School so many years ago, uh, is, is the right way to go in my view. I think it solves great risks that the state currently faces under the current system, which effectively by leaving dollars among wealthy and, and poorer taxpayers in particular towns, uh, that raises a constitutional question that at some point the state is likely to face. I think 504's, House Bill 504's effort to address that with a uh, remitting the proceeds like the meals and rooms tax, that tax is collected locally and remitted to the state. That's all this bill proposes. And I think it is a smart way to avoid a, a problem in the future that could arise when uh, taxpayers of, of communities argue, hey, how come that wealthy taxpayer in that town is getting a tax break when we're not? And so with that, knowing you have other witnesses, I would just like to say thank you uh, uh, Chairman uh, Majors and other members for the opportunity to address the committee. And I want to say how much I appreciated working with Representative Ames and the leadership of this commission and the whole team uh, on such an important issue like education funding. I look forward to working with the legislature as it considers all these issues going forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ardender. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Uh -oh. Abrami, Representative Abrami. Mr. Chair, I've got a, a quick question for you for uh, directly. I didn't see your hand up. We're planning on having work sessions on this bill, correct? Uh, yes, we will. All right. And uh, Mr. Ardinger, will you be available when we have a work session to add some clarity from your perspective? You, you have a good way of uh, explaining things. Well. I thank you, Representative Abrami, and it's great to see you and every member. If the committee would have me and Representative Ames would tolerate me a little bit longer, I would love to participate in the work session. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Alamey. 
Yes, also a quick question. I'm glad that you will be coming. You would not come to our committee for a long time. Um, and, but I, I would like to get your perspective on how hard it's going to be to, to solve the issues of renters and tuition and a number of other things that don't quite do the job on, on the formula that's going uh, not, not specifically for the low income dwellers, but on, in the renter case, yes. And he couldn't respond to that at our work session coming up. Yes, I would I, I first say to Representative Almi, I love this committee. When I was 18 years old, I was elected from Cornish and Croydon and proudly served as a member of this committee. And, and in this case, I'm not actually a lobbyist, which makes me more confident and comfortable <laughs> coming before you so, and with you. So I would also say, yes, um, other states have faced the renter issue as representative Ames knows. Uh, it is not an easy issue, but other states have come up with some pretty clever approaches and a great organization just south of us in Cambridge, the Lincoln Land Institute has some great, as representative Almy, I think I've been to events there with you in the past. Uh, Daphne Kenyon and others there have some good information on that that I think would help the work session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, it's only right to, to get uh, another view. And there's uh, Richard Stanton, an elect, uh, Representative Stanton, elected official representing himself, who opposes and he said he needs five minutes. I don't see him in the attendees. I've looked for him. Okay, that saves us five minutes. The next is Representative Marjorie Porter, elected official from Hillsborough in support and needs three minutes. In the last three minutes took about 10 minutes. So if everybody takes- Hello, I, I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes we can. Okay. A oh, weird thing happened on my computer. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, and I will be brief. I timed myself at three minutes and eight seconds. For the record, my name is Marjorie Porter, and I represent Hillsborough District 1 and the towns of Antrim, Hillsborough, and Windsor. Representative Ames and Luno and Mr. Ardinger have done a fine job here explaining the details of this bill and all the ins and outs of finances that your committee deals with so well but I would like to bring it down now to the local level and how passage of HB 504 will provide real help to real people. Specifically, I want to talk about my constituents here in Hillsborough. Hillsborough is a working class community and is frugal with its money. Local boards are careful not to ask too much and to keep annual budget increases small. I served on the school board for a while and I know how hard that board works to do the best possible for the kids without overburdening the taxpayers. The school district is SB2. Most of the budgets passed in the last 10 years have been default level funded budgets. There are no frills. Despite this, we have one of the higher tax rates in the state and homeowners have seen their property taxes increase year after year. Personally, the taxes on my modest ranch style home on a small town lot increased 20% between 2016 and 2020. I thought things might hold steady for us this year as our school tax rate actually decreased by $2.40 a thousand. But that was not to be. The housing market is strong and home values have increased. There was a reassessment. Instead of going down, property taxes increased once again. Mine went up another $320. Of course, the largest tax bite is the local school taxes and overburdened taxpayers, frustrated and angry, blame the schools and the school board and the teachers, despite how hard everyone has worked to keep the expenses down. This adversarial and often confrontational situation harms the community pitting schools and parents with school-age kids 
against other taxpayers, many of whom are retirees on a fixed income. There seems to be no relief and no end in sight. This is unsustainable. Depending on where you look online, the median household income in Hillsborough is somewhere between $55,000 and $80,000 a year. Assuming the true figure is somewhere in the middle, it's obvious a significant number of homeowners in town could see some real relief if this bill is signed into law. For my constituents, I hope the committee will look favorably on HB 504. While many tax cuts are being proposed for businesses this year, little is being done about the largest tax New Hampshire residents pay, the property tax. HB 504 addresses that, at least until the state can come up with a more equitable and fair way of funding our public schools. It offers some hope for many, including our hardworking families and those on fixed incomes. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Porter. Any questions for Representative Porter? Uh, I get to the panelists. I don't see any. So the next would be a Jennifer Boyston, representing herself from the public and support. Yep. Is she here, Janine? Uh, let me try that again. I thought she was there. Um. B O Y L S T O N. Yeah, I, I had her in and then, oh, here she is. Let, let me do it again. Yep, she's out here. She just needs to unmute. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Je Jennifer, you signed up for in support yeah. in three minutes. Yep. Sorry, I had a technical difficulty with my audio. Yep. So I have um, just a quick comment that I'm pulling up here. And I want to say thank you. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, talk with you today. And why can't I? There we go. Sorry. All right. I think I'm, yeah. And I'm, I want to testify in support of this bill. Um, and I'll start by saying that I live in a small town in the Upper Valley, um, which is called Lyme, New Hampshire. Um, many people in our town uh, recognize the importance of public education and they want to support our schools. But like most communities in New Hampshire, we have residents with a diversity of incomes. Some of these incomes are very high, some of them are moderate, and others are low. Many of our residents are retired and they live on fixed incomes. Uh, many of those retired members of our community particularly live in a town whose demographics have shifted dramatically over the past two decades. And they may live in houses that are currently assessed at values that they would not have easily afforded when they worked and earned income. As we build our, budget, our, as we build our budgets for town and school, these vulnerable residents are at the forefront of everyone's mind. And we struggle with the constantly increasing costs of education. We make many compromises, particularly on municipal spending to manage costs, and all of this is done with the aim of protecting our vulnerable residents. I, I see this bill as imparting some fairness to what I will admit I believe is a fundamentally unjust system of taxation. This isn't a cure-all, but it does attempt to address a serious conflict. And moreover, as a previous representative I think noted, it does address a common worry expressed by so-called donor towns. Donor towns worry about the ability of their retired and low-income residents to be able to afford their taxes. Many towns across New Hampshire worry about the same thing, but we have to do it without the help of state subsidization of costs. And I hope that you'll keep that in mind as you consider um, the acceptance of, of this bill. And thank you for giving me the time to, to talk. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mrs. Williamson, any questions from the committee? Any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much.
The next is from um, Representative McKetchen from oh. City of Portsmouth, an elected official uh, in opposition, and he signed up for three minutes. Representative McKitchen. Did I say that? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Honorable Chair and members of the committee. My name is Daglin McCachran, and I come before you to speak against House Bill 504 as presented. As many of, of, uh, have mentioned, I don't wish to return to the donor town language of the past, uh, but that's what this bill uh, proposes to do. I was seven when five New Hampshire communities sued the state, arguing that the education funding system was unconstitutional. 30 years later, I agree with the Supreme Court that for the purposes of providing an adequate education, New Hampshire is one community. And I believe that every child in New Hampshire should get the same opportunities as I will strive to give my two daughters. I believe so strongly because if it were not for my own education and that of my parents, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today. I speak today as more than a dad who believes in education. I'm a counselor from the city of Portsmouth, my hometown. I live across the street from the house my dad grew up in and the one that my grandfather built. I didn't need to take my dad's word for it that Portsmouth has changed. You have likely seen it for yourself. You might look at the rooms and meals revenue and wonder if there's a home cook among us, but equally foolish is to look at our assessed value and believe a majority of folks could afford to buy their homes at that price. I certainly couldn't and I've only owned my home for six years. My time on the council has shown me that there are many struggling under their property tax and we support the provisions of tax relief, but not how this bill chooses to fund them. A return to a donor town education funding model through SWEP, notwithstanding some of the modest increase in deductions could drive residents from ours and other similarly situated communities. In any municipal election, you speak to a lot of people. I love meeting new people and hearing their stories, but I hate hearing a familiar refrain of neighbors that don't know what to do because of the property tax. You know, you're when a budget might go up one to 2% because of downshifting of state responsibilities, some tax bills would go up 20 to 30%. Why? Valuations. You might point out, Deglin, increased valuations mean lower tax rate. The whole reason you're here is that Portsmouth has a lower tax rate than another community. That type of logic is halfway there. If you look at the rate and not the valuation, you miss what is driving the pain. Because of comparable wholesale home sale appraisal method, your tax rate can and often will fall in property rich areas only to see your taxes rise when similar homes sell. The similar appraisal method required by the state in order to fill our assessment duties means that when a home in a neighborhood sells at an increased value it will cause other houses to be assessed at higher values, which results in higher taxes, creating a vicious circle. Having to replace education funding sent to the state through the reinstatement of the donor town education funding model will only accelerate this cycle. Many in these communities will be forced to leave and by their leaving will lose a piece of our history. There are a few that understand this last point and still shrug their shoulders. Are we supposed to cry for someone's house increasing in value? I hear that a lot as if houses weren't places to raise our families, but investment vehicles flip frequently in search of ever increasing gains. Our communities are places to rely on one another, forming bonds and friendships people we can count on in a snowstorm when our brother dies, not just containers for investment since everyone will sell in four to six years once they maximize their profit and are ready to bring their house to the market like a farmer brings their corn. Call me old fashioned, but I want more than that in a house and a community. Perpetuating a broken system that will one day break for everyone will first destroy communities like Portsmouth. I grew up here, I stayed here. I want to be sharing stories with the New Hampshire I know, not telling stories of the New Hampshire I remember. If you have any compassion for our history and the people that make up each donor town community, if you believe like I do, the strength of a tree is not just the new leaves and branches sprouting looking for sunlight, but also the roots that dig deep into the soil, then I ask you to reject this bill. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. McKenchen. Um, questions? Questions? I don't see any. So uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Paul Shane has had his hand up since the second person. I would just say that he didn't sign up ahead of time. Um, yeah, I'm right now I'm taking the ones that have signed up to testify. 
Uh, uh, we'll answer that, and we'll look at the others. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, one other person that was on the list that I gave you was uh, Jeffrey uh, McLynch from the School sir. Funding Project. You're right, and he's a lobbyist, and I'm going to take the lobbyist after I finish the work. Uh, That's just fine. I just didn't want him forgotten. No, there's uh, another, there's two lobbyists that signed up, and it's actually not on anymore. Hmm. Who, McLynch? Yeah, I saw him earlier, but I don't. I just saw him. him. Uh, he's now at the top, and he's got his oh, hand up. We, we, we need to continue. The time is running out. All right. So um, the next is a Korean. C A S C A D B E N. Cassadin. Yeah. She's a member of the public in support. <laughs> and she needs two minutes. Hello, am I all set with sound? Yes. Yes, you're all set. Great. Well, Chairman Major and committee members, thank you for this opportunity to express the need for your support and approval of House Bill 504. I'm Corrine Cascadden retired from 11 years as a North Country School Superintendent and a 45 year educator in both private and public education. I've been serving as an active member on the New Hampshire School Funding Commission as well during this past year. My primary career was served for the city of Berlin where there is an obvious and clear lack of economic tax base to supplement revenues from the local property taxpayers. I know budgets well and have had to make decisions to eliminate programs, teachers, administrator positions, and close school buildings in order to prevent the city from financial plight. Just to give you a noted difference on two communities that I am a property owner in, in 2009, for 2019, Berlin's overall property tax rate was $32.28 per thousand of value on an equalized basis. That includes a local and state education tax rate of $12.68. In the town of Errol, the overall rate was $13.39 with, uh, with a total state and local education tax rate of just $5.86 needed to meet very similar public education requirements. So legislators must work to improve the equity of the New Hampshire property tax system by remitting the revenues from the statewide education property tax to the state, we must prevent the continuation of inequity of funding our public school systems. House members have the power to ensure the gap of student opportunities in our public schools is decreased rather than continue to be increased. All New Hampshire communities share the need for a well-educated workforce and thus have the need for an equitable education system. House Bill 504 stands to enhance opportunities for property tax relief for low and moderate income homeowners in all communities. The sponsors of this bill, I'm sorry, what? No. The, the sponsors of this bill know firsthand the need to change New Hampshire school funding from the dependence on local property taxpayers to a statewide tax system to equitably fund a New Hampshire adequate education. This bill also requires revenue from the statewide education property tax to be co collected in a central manner via DRA for redistribution to the communities who are in most need and who lack the ability and resources to maintain their public school programs. It is only a wish of North Country School students to have the opportunities and resources of other wealthier towns. I urge a committee to vote in support of House Bill 504 as a first step process toward providing an equitable statewide public school funding program that meets adequacy for all communities, not just property wealthy ones, and that increases opportunities for all students, not just some. I recommend you all review the extensive work of the New Hampshire School Funding Commission in its final report, which is posted on the UNH Carsey School of Public Policy website if you have not already. Conclusions there were drawn from research and facts Please do your part to assist New Hampshire property taxpayers. And I thank you today for your undivided attention and time. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Kasadian. 
That's good. And uh, any questions? Any questions? I don't see any. So we'll go to David McGuckin, M-C-G-U-C-K-I-N, on elected, oh, Representative McGuckin, in my town in opposition, and he requests in two minutes. Do not see him either. M-C-G-U-C-K-I-N? No. You, you, uh... I didn't, I've looked for him before and didn't see him and I still don't see him. Okay. Now I will go back to the obvious. Uh, Stephanie Bray. Yes. From the New Hampshire Legal Assistance and support makes three minutes. Stephanie Bray here. Yeah, I yes, her and she raised her hand, and my click didn't work. So here she is. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, and you go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Stephanie Bray, and I'm here on behalf of New Hampshire Legal Assistance. And this bill does three things in my mind that are good. And I don't think I need a minute to talk about each of them. The first good thing that this bill does, perhaps nobody has noticed, nobody's mentioned it, it amends RSA 76 section 11A to increase the visibility on everyone's tax bill of the low, uh, the availability of tax relief programs such as low and moderate income, but also abatement and deferral and the other programs that my clients would like to benefit from. They can't benefit from those programs if they don't know they exist. And um, making the notice more prominent by requiring it to be in bold 12 point type is very sorely needed. And so that's one good thing. The second good thing that this bill does is make the low and moderate income property tax relief program uh, more generous and available to more people. And uh, we are in favor of that as well. And the third good thing that this bill does is the study committee um, which addresses um, how property taxes affect tenants, which I think is wonderful and um, not enough people have paid attention to. And also um, to be covered in the study committee are uh, the needs of people uh, for deferral of their property taxes. So um, I think that is a very um, useful project. So those are the good things that uh, we think this bill does. And I would be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Bray and Mrs. Bray for your testimony. Uh, we do have two people with questions, Representative Army. Thank you. I'll be really quick on about property tax deferrals. I thought that that was just to try to figure out a way for the state to substitute for the local deferrals. Do you find that local deferrals are frequently not allowed? I find that a lot of towns don't even know they're a thing. I have had to educate a few, quite a few towns that deferral is a thing. Um, I also have to explain um, what um, disabled means for purposes of deferral and that deferral is available to disabled persons in addition to elderly persons. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. So Representative Tucker. Oh, I, I had my question answered. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, uh, Jeff McLynch 
is a lobbyist for the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project in support, and he signed up for three minutes. Good afternoon. Can the committee members hear me all right? Yes. Wonderful. Well, Chairman Major, Representative Almey, and members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, testify before you this afternoon. For the record, my name is Jeff McClinch, and I am indeed a lobbyist, but my sole client, so to speak, is the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project, where I am the project director. As House Bill 504 would make New Hampshire's tax system significantly more fair, the New Hampshire School Funding Fairness Project strongly supports the bill and urges the committee to recommend it as ought to pass. As members of this committee are uniquely aware, you can't talk about New Hampshire's tax system without talking about the property tax. It's far and away the largest tax collected in New Hampshire, generating close to $4 billion to support state and local public services in 2019, well in excess of any other form of taxation levied in the state. Yet the property tax is also an unfair tax as it places far greater responsibility on low and moderate income taxpayers than it does on more affluent ones. According to data from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, the poorest fifth of New Hampshire households paid 6.2% of their incomes in property taxes in 2018. In contrast, the wealthiest 1%, each of which enjoyed an income in excess of over $500,000, paid an effective property tax rate of under 2%. Now, despite its heavy reliance on the property tax, and in turn, that tax is heavy toll on the least well off, New Hampshire does precious little to mitigate the impact of the tax on those struggling to make ends meet. Um, I think you all have talked a little bit today about the existing low and moderate income property tax relief program. Sadly, that program has all but evaporated in recent years. In 2003, it had provided roughly seven and a half million dollars in relief to over 27,000 Granite State households. By 2018, those figures have dwindled to fewer than 7,000 households, receiving a total of just $1.1 million in rebates, even as property taxes continue to climb. The bill before you this afternoon would change that and change it dramatically. If enacted into law, House Bill 504 would significantly increase both the number of homeowners eligible to receive relief and the value of the rebates they would receive. I believe Representative Ames has already reviewed the change in the various parameters, so I don't want to belabor that point, but I do want to emphasize that this bill would extend or would change the programs that apply not just to the statewide property tax, but to local school property taxes as well. And just to offer an example of what that might mean for New Hampshire uh, family, let's take a married couple living in Charlestown. For the sake of this example, let's assume the couple has an income of about $45,000 and lives in a home worth $150,000. Um, in 2019, on an equalized basis, the local school property tax rate that they paid was just over $20 per thousand. The statewide rate was $1.76. So their property tax bill, strictly for school purposes, was about $3,300. Their overall bill is probably closer to $5,000 or more than 10% of their total income. Under current law, they would not receive any relief whatsoever because their income was too high. And even if their income were sufficiently low, the maximum amount of relief they would receive would be no more than about $180. If House Bill 504 became law, they would receive a rebate of $1,000. $1,000 that they could use at local businesses to put food on their table, eat in their home, and gas in their car. Now, um, this is one other aspect of the bill that's already been discussed, so I don't want to belabor it too much. But uh, House Bill 504 does advance taxpayer equity in one other critical way, as it would end the preferential treatment that some property wealthy municipalities now enjoy under the statewide property tax. Um, many of you have heard before, but uh, in Claremont 2, the Supreme Court ruled that to the extent a property tax is used to fund an adequate education, the tax must be administered in a way that's uniform in rate throughout the state. In its current form, the swept is far from uniform. Cities and towns with comparatively high property wealth are permitted to retain any revenue from the tax over and above what's needed to meet the cost of an adequate education. As a result, the swept in its present form exacerbates the wide disparities in school property tax rates that now exist throughout New Hampshire. Uh, by restoring that swept as a true statewide tax, House Bill 504 promotes not only greater equity, but fiscal responsibility too. As the revenue returning from the, to the state from swept would be used to offset the cost of the additional rebates associated with the property tax relief provisions. Uh, those costs will be further limited uh, by capping individual rebates at no more than $1,000. Uh, as I conclude, I just would like to note that this committee has already heard extensive testimony this session about numerous changes in tax law to spur economic growth, 
and to ease the financial hardships arising from the pandemic. Any effort to use New Hampshire's tax system to achieve those ends should start with House Bill 504. It would put hundreds of dollars in the pockets of grant staters still coping with the economic consequences of the pandemic and allow them to shop and spend at local businesses striving to remain open. For these reasons, I once again urge the committee to recommend House Bill 504 is out to pass. And I look forward to working with all of you if there should be worse work sessions. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. McLunch. Questions from the committee. Uh, Representative Abromney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. McLunch, for your testimony. Going back to the low and moderate income homeowners property tax relief, uh, which is under RSA 198-57. Now that statute hasn't changed over the years. Is that correct? And so if that's the case, then why is it that, that <clears throat> the number of people um, availing themselves to this is, is occurring? So uh, you're correct that um, in some respects it's not changed. Um, and most notably the income thresholds that um, you see uh, in the bill have not changed in those 15 years. So um, they've not kept pace with inflation. Um, so naturally you would expect that some people would become ineligible over time. The biggest consequence though is changes in the statewide property tax itself. As I believe was mentioned earlier, that tax used to be levied at $6.60 $6 per thousand, which meant that it provided greater relief, relief and greater incentive to folks to take part. Um, because of changes to bring that rate down to under $2, um, it no longer delivers the same amount of relief that it once did. Thank you. Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Mr. McLynch, uh, I understand the nature of the problem you're describing, and I would uh, echo that you've chosen Charlestown as a prime example. That's the town I represent. What I'm failing to see in this bill or understand in the uh, testimony is how this would help to mitigate the real estate property tax rate in Charlestown. Uh, you used a figure of a little over 24, just to update uh, the budget that will be on our ballot March 9th will result in a local ed a rate of 27.55. And when you combine that with the SWEPT, we're bumping right up against 30. I don't see anything in this bill that mitigates the overall burden on the community, which affects absolutely everything in the community, including its desirability for anyone new to move in, open a business, expand a business, stay. So where do we go if the problem for property poor communities is the effect of the rate on the entire community? Uh, thank you very much for that question, Representative. Um, I, I guess I would respond with a couple of thoughts. Uh, the first is that with the property tax relief provisions that are in this bill, the effective rate that folks in Charlestown would pay, or at least the effective rate for low and moderate income folks in Charlestown would pay, would drop. So that while the rate on their bill might be the same as, as you just described, um, they would be receiving a check of up to $1,000 to help offset those costs. The second thing I would mention is that if depending on sort of the particulars of how many people take up the property tax relief um, option, this bill would generate additional funds to the, to the order of 25 to $30 million annually from restoring the stuff, funds that would then be available to be redistributed in a way that they're not now to cities and towns that are really struggling to fund schools in an adequate way. And then the third point I would offer is that um, the two um, chief ideas in this bill are grounded in the work of the commission that Representative Ames and Representative Luno and Mr. Ardinger all served upon. And that the work of that commission uh, was extensive and extended beyond to address issues with school funding to make it more equitable. And I believe there's other legislation now being considered um, in the Senate in particular that would act upon those recommendations. Um, in listening to the testimony today, um, you know, I was reflecting upon the nature of some questions about um, donor towns or towns that receive property tax abatements. Th that debate is in large measure a function of the fact that um, school, excuse me, um, state education aid 
is woefully inadequate and does not meet the full responsibility of the state. If state ed education aid were, came closer to the actual cost that states and towns incurred in serving their children, we would not be having this conversation at all about donor tenants because that aid would be significantly more than what is generated through the state property tax today. Any further questions uh, for Mr. McFlinch? Uh, hold on a second. I don't see it, but thank you, Mr. McFlinch. Thank you. If I go to the attendees, uh, hey, Paul Deshane has his hand up. Bringing him in. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And Paul, is are you um, testifying for or against, and how long? What happened to Paul? <sighs> there we go. Paul. Are we, there? are we there again? Are you testifying for or against the bill? And how long do you plan? To uh, I'll be very short, probably under two minutes, and I'm in opposition. Um, logistics didn't prevent, uh, prevented me from uh, logging on earlier and, and noting that, so I apologize for that. But I thank you for the opportunity to join the group. Uh, this afternoon. I represent or work for the town of Newington and I'm uh, providing uh, their opposition to the proposed uh, House Bill 504. And, and I will have written commentary shortly to the, the uh, uh, staff to circulate amongst you uh, after uh, the committee uh, session. Uh, but to summarize, uh, we applaud uh, in the town of Newington that this issue is being addressed. Uh, the low and moderate uh, income house uh, homeowner property tax relief program uh, has been neglected for any number of years. Uh, however, when uh, the funding mechanism that is uh, envisioned here uh, of uh, providing the $25 million uh, in uh, relief money comes from only 46 communities uh, in the state uh, who are going to end up turning over approximately $28 million over to the state. That's something that we don't think is appropriate and uh, is again, resumption of the donor and receiver town concept, uh, which the town of Newington and others are uh, opposed to. Now, uh, I also object somewhat to the, the description of, of these wealthy towns uh, and versus poorer towns. I'll use an example for Newington itself. Yes, it appears because of the amount of uh, industry and commercial development that the town has, um, then perhaps it has resources that other towns don't. But in terms of this particular bill, uh, I would like to point out of the $1.2 billion worth of assessed value, nearly half of it is utility property. So only half of our tax base is going to be able to contribute under this bill towards our obligation uh, envisioned. Uh, and that would be approximately uh, $815,000. That's $815,000 that is currently going to support our children's education, but will have to be turned over to the state and then re raised again locally in order to make up that deficit. Um, so the impact to, to residents uh, here in Newington is going to be significant because of that proportional uh, value of, of non-utility values uh, is going to have to be the tax base that's going to support that. The other thing that's unfortunate the bill doesn't address is, is that it doesn't address a local uh, our property tax relief in general. It only speaks to the state uh, wide prop education property tax. Uh, so I think uh, we all agree that the high property tax uh, burdens are, uh, are, are significant to all taxpayers regardless of their source, be it a statewide, the local, or education, or even the county. So there's a, there's a disparity or a missing piece of tax relief for these taxpayers that's envisioned because it's only addressing the statewide property tax element. Um, lastly, uh, in a more personal observation, um, I would like to note that there perhaps is a technical deficiency with the bill under section one, where it speaks to uh, uh, turning over the excess swept uh, to uh, the Department of Revenue Administration. It speaks to subtracting a municipal's actual costs of carrying out the functions required in the subdivision. And later it uh, defers to the Department of Revenue Administration and the Commissioner of Education to determine what those carrying costs are. Uh, I would like to and hope the committee would entertain an amendment uh, that would uh, spell out what those carrying costs uh, can be considered. 
Uh, otherwise, it's at the full discretion of the, of the two commissioners. Uh, although I'm sure they'll they'll give uh, due consideration in, in the regulation uh, development. Uh, but I would like to see a recognition that there are carrying costs to any property tax collection system, which includes the assessment of the property, the billing uh, costs, the collection costs, including administration, lien and deeding costs, uh, the cost of abatements, um, which can be over multiple years, uh, not just the current tax year. So they have to be recognized over a two or more year period. And of course the, the lost interest income um, that if these funds need to be turned over to the state uh, in an immediate fashion uh, after the tax billing, then there's no ability or there's the loss function of a town to have investment income uh, off these revenues. So these are all carrying costs that I think uh, should be identified and direct uh, the commissioners in their process in determining uh, what those uh, carrying costs are and then what they should be uh, in deducting out uh, from the $28 million that's going to be collected. So uh, with that, I'll leave uh, uh, my testimony uh, at that and uh, let the, the written testimony coming subsequently to speak to itself. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Shane. Would you take questions? Certainly. Uh, Representative Bromney. You're on mute. You got on your Bob. I mean, Pat. Pat, you. Yeah, sorry about that. I just wanted. It's not a really a question. I just want to say hello to Paul. Paul was our very first uh, town administrator in Stratum for, and he was there for almost, nearly thirty years. He retired recently, so I just want to say hello, Paul. Thank you, Pat. Nice seeing you too. Any questions from the committee of Mr. Duchesne? I do not see any, and let me just check. There's nobody else signed up. And on the list, there's 187 have signed up in support of the bill, and 80, 38 have signed up in opposition to the bill. And I'm not going to read all the names. Want the names? We'll send you the list. Anybody else have any questions or comments before I close the public hearing on House Bill 504? Seeing no hands raised, and I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 504. It would take two minutes, and then we'll go into the last bill of the day, which is supposed to have started at two o'clock. Okay, we're just one hour behind. Just be back, be back in two minutes.
Okay. I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 621-FN, an act allowing registered deeds to retain a portion of the land community heritage investment program surcharge. The prime sponsor is Rec Representative McConkey and um, is he here? Janine? I just brought him in. Okay. Representative uh, Conkey? Yes, yes, thank you. And you can uh, thank you. introduce your bill. Um, thank you. Uh, Chairman, uh, Major, illustrious members of Ways and Means, for the record, my name is Mark McConkey. I represent Carroll County 3. Hail from Freedom, and once again, serve as Vice Chair on Public Works. I'm before you today to ask your committee to vote ought to pass on House Bill 621. And I'm hoping um, that Representative Janagian uh, might be able to offer an amendment to that at the appropriate time. Uh, it's the establishment of a registry of deeds restoration account under RSA 47817K to retain an additional 10% of the total additional charges collected for the purpose of funding the maintenance, repair, restoration of land records, and it continues. I have served my county delegation for more than seven terms and have been told repeatedly by my registrar that the cost to preserve our oldest land documents is more is a, presently a cost of more than uh, $11 million. Uh, while we whittle away at our need, Registrar Lisa Scott asked if the legislature might find a way to contribute. After much discussion with uh, my Registrar Lisa Scott and she with her fellow registrars, uh, we believe House Bill 624 is that vehicle. A letter uh, was sent to the committee, and I hope you have, which was uh, uh, signed by eight of the 10 registrars offering their support for House Bill 621. And while Kathy Ann Stacy, the Rockingham Register, did not sign the letter of endorsement, uh, she did also send a letter to the committee dated uh, February 5th. And that she says, not every county makes a commitment nor can registrars commit funds for preservation without the approval of the commission as a delegation. Unfortunately, the importance of these historical land records in many cases is ignored. Should registration of the historical land records continue to be ignored, the result could be permanent destruction uh, due to deterioration of these fragile documents. In turn, results in the inability of research the title to the land. How many property owners obtain clear title, a mortgage or sell their property? The Land and Heritage Investment Program can be applauded for its work to protect community landmarks, but what good is a landmark if historical title data cannot be accessed at the Registry of Deeds? Before, um, and there'll be many behind me with my registrar and others with more to say, but before I end my testimony, I'd like to address the physical note attached on the original uh, ed, on this LSR. And um, if amended, I don't presume that will change. It would appear to me that the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program, LCHIP, uh, funds nearly 33 projects on an average year. Uh, those projects are, are, if you were to average them out, are about $121,000 a piece. 
the fiscal note said the anticipated cost of this house bill would be uh, $350,000 $350, annually, um, which, in, which in my mind uh, might result in uh, three less projects being granted annually. While I respect the work that's done by LCHIP, um, I believe that um, our bill here is worthy of your consideration uh, because those land records are also historical documents that need to be funded. Uh, I am happy to take any questions and I will remind you that my registrar is signed up to speak after me uh, properly with uh, more detail on the bill. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd happy to take any questions if you have them at this late hour. Well, thank you for your testimony, testimony Representative McConkey. Uh, Representative Emberg has a question. Is that me, Mr. Chairman? That you. Representative Schamberg, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for taking my question, Representative. In regards to the importance of why this request to retain a 10% portion of the LCHIP surcharge uh, is being made, why wasn't a standalone bill introduced to add a new fee or surcharge uh, that the registers could have added uh, other than proposing to take the LCHIP fund surcharge? Thank you. I, um, thank, um, I thank you for uh, the question, Representative. Um, the um, LCHIP um, presently is um, is um, providing a 4% um, surcharge on the documents that are pertinent to this. And in my conversations with, um, with uh, legislative services and the registrars, um, uh, we had not thought of the direction that you're speaking of, sir, and felt that this was fitting uh, to place inside this LSR, excuse me, inside this RSA. All set, Representative Schamberg. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, further questions? Just check. I don't see any further questions, so we will go to Lisa Scott, uh, Representative Scott from. Uh, who's in support of the bill and needs five minutes to testify. Representative Scott. Mr. Chairman and representatives, thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of Bill H6, HB 621. I hope to only take two minutes of your time. My name is Lisa. I'm the Carroll County Register of Deeds. An H Bill HB 621 provides funding for the repair and maintenance of the official land record, which is the foundation of private property rights and our land and our huge community heritage. New Hampshire RSA 227M colon one, which is the supporting legislation for the community heritage investment program. It states that the intent of the program is to conserve and preserve the state's most important natural, cultural, and historical resources through the acquisition of lands and cultural and historical resources or interests therein. This bill proposes that the official land record cared for at the Registry of Deeds offices is a significant cultural and historical resource worthy of support of the Community and Heritage Land Investment Program. LCHIP projects require proof of clear title and a survey plan, both of which can only be achieved through researching the records of the Registry of Deeds. This fact demonstrates the close relationship between the registry records and the Land and the commun Community Heritage Investment Program. LCHIP grants rely on the evidence found in the deeds and the plans recorded with the registries. Registry records are the foundation upon which LCHIP projects rest. And all infrastructures require maintenance. The cost to repair and restore deeds and plans is very high. 
and is currently borne completely by the counties. Millions of dollars are needed to properly care for the documents. Passing this bill will provide registries funds to support restoration of the documents without raising additional fees or taxes. If passed, the funds would only be used to repair and restore the registry records, and it would be supporting the infrastructure which confirms our land and our community heritage and our property rights. I ask you to support HB 621. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony, Mrs. Scott. Um, would you take any questions? Of course. From Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Scott, on, I was on my county delegation executive committee for 10 years, something like that. And I remember um, that the deeds office does more than pay for itself all the time. And that the money provided from that, uh, in our case in Grafton, uh, went and goes to the upkeep of the Register of Deeds office, including uh, a very long-term project working on this. And I'm wondering whether uh, somebody among you is going to be able to tell us how much money has been put forth to this over the last five years, say, and uh, how far you've gotten back in your deeds records. We'd gotten back quite a ways when I left the executive committee. Um, and um, whether any of it gets taken off for other functions of the county. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Representative Almi. Over the past five years, four years here at the registry, Carroll County has spent approximately $600,000 on restoration of the records and archival work. And yet we have gotten through book 135, which is significant, but it's not very far into the books. We're in book 3000 right now. We haven't started on the plans and the plans are the majority of the cost. Our delegation and the commissioners take this very seriously and have put significant funds, as you can tell from the past five, four years. And this year we ask for more as well. And yet the project is so large that it's a burden to the county. Yes, the county does receive funding over and above what the costs of the deeds office are. And it is found, the delegation has found it necessary to use some of those funds for other county functions. I ask every year to keep those funds within this office, but that's all I can do is to ask. It's a big problem for the counties, particularly the smaller counties that don't have a lot of income. Uh, Representative Tucker. No, I um, I was going to ask the very same question, so I put my okay. hand up. Representative Bromley. I want to make sure. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, is it Ms. Scott? Um, let's just make sure we all understand. So 4%, there's currently a 4% surcharge on top of the real estate transfer tax. Is that correct? We're talking about the L chip surcharge, which is yes. assessed on four different documents. Oh, right, it's a $25 right. per document document fee and as an administrative cost the counties keep four percent and the 96 percent goes to the state which then in turn gives it to the l chip trust fund right See, I already so we are question. asking for an additional 10 percent of that fee for the specific purpose of restoration and repair of the records 
Uh, just follow up. I want to make sure I understand. So, ten oh, of of the of the four percent on these document fees that's going to to LCHIP, you you would like to see up to ten percent uh, taken from LCHIP and used for this purpose. Is that correct? Uh, would you uh, allow me to reword that? Yeah, that's why I asked the question. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> you it correctly. <laughs> Four documents recorded with $25 worth of fees each, $100. When at the end of the month we send our money to the state of New Hampshire, 4% is withheld to the county and given to the treasurer to administer collecting the funds. We're asking for an additional $10, an additional 10% to be retained by the county and put in a separate designated fund specifically for the use of repair and restoration of the records. Therefore, we'd be sending 86% of the funds received for LCHIP to the state of New Hampshire, which would then pass it on to the LCHIP trust. Right. I'm a little confused. I'm usually not this thick. So, um, so does, uh, will LCHIP get less money for their normal purposes uh, from this? I guess it's another way of trying to understand this. LCHIP will receive less funds for their... Uh, yes. The answer is a complicated yes, because I believe that the LCHIP grant, the law, includes land and cultural heritage, which Deeds are a part of that. Plans are a part of that. We hold here the documents that prove that LCHIP grants are legitimate. So in my mind, the deeds fall under the LCHIP law. And so would LCHIP receive the ex that 10%? They wouldn't get the money in hand, but the money would be spent to justify their projects. Representative Romney, if you look at the fiscal note, LCHIP gets about three and a half million dollars a year from this special assessment for documents. And what they're asking for is 10% of that, which is about $350,000 a year go towards this restoration fund. But the 350000 does not go to LCHIP for other purposes, correct? Right. That's what I want to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, I read this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Representative Chamberg. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I guess the question I have, Ms. Scott, thank you, Mr. Chairman, is that you're wanting another 10% on top of the present 4% that is presently taken out of the surcharge. And is this number 350,000 including, is this the total will be 14% now? Is that 350,000 or is there, or is it higher? Is it like more 400 and some thousand that will be taken? Overall, it would be a total of 14% taken, whatever amount is taken. And this past year, Carroll County, uh, well, I, I can't address how much money LCHIP has received from the LCHIP uh, surcharge, except for what is on the uh, initial bill, which says it was 3.5 million. 14% of that would be retained at the county level. Each county okay. would get 14%. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Any other questions? Seeing none, then Representative McConkie is testifying in support and Representative McConkie said he would need four minutes. Isn't he the prime sponsor? Did he spoke? Did already. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we have Sheila Vargas next. Is that it's right? Been, uh, it'll be a long day. <laughs> yeah, Sheila Vargas. Okay. 
and the lobbyist from the Nature Conservative and opposes the bill and needs three minutes. Thank you, Chairman Major. Uh, I hope my audio is all right. And I, I'm hoping I can also uh, spare all of you and not use the entirety of the three minutes as I have submitted written testimony as well. Thank so, you very much. <laughs> Would, I would also just like to state for the record, um, my name is Sheila Vargas. I'm the Government and Community Relations Manager for the Nature Conservancy in New Hampshire. And I am here testifying in opposition to House Bill 621 FN. And I will be testifying not only for the Nature Conservancy, but also for New Hampshire Audubon, for the Appalachian Mountain Club and New Hampshire Lakes. We have uh, provided joint testimony for you today. So we are opposed to this bill for a, a number of reasons. Currently, LCHIP fees are collected from recording fees assessed for certain documents, as you heard, by the 10 New Hampshire County Register of Deeds and transferred to the state treasury into the dedicated fund, which is administered by the LCHIP program. So I'm just going to skip over some of uh, the housekeeping portions of our opposition. As you've heard um, the reasons why and how the funds go into the dedicated fund that was created by RSA 227M. I would like to note uh, the previous individuals who testified in support of the bill um, clearly stated that the dedicated fund RSA 227M does state that the funds are to be used to conserve and preserve the state's most important natural, cultural, and historical resources. What they failed to uh, continue with that statement and continue saying was the remainder of that RSA, which clearly states through the acquisition of lands and cultural and historic, through the acquisition of lands and cultural and historical resources, or interest therein of local, regional, and statewide significance in partnership with the state's municipalities and the private sector for the primary purposes of protecting and ensuring the perpetual contributions of these resources to the state's economy, environment, and overall quality of life. Nothing within this RSA, if read in its entirety, States that these funds can or should be used for the purposes outlined in House Bill 16. Sorry, I'm just I'm getting a little feedback from someone's mic, I think. Uh, finally, the bill would deprive a popular and oversubscribed program of needed revenue to fulfill its statutory obligation. Aside from the obligations of maintaining the integrity of LCHIP's dedicated fund, there is also a clear need to prevent any funds from being diverted from this highly popular program from which applicants for funding consistently exceed the funds available. And I believe Digit, who is with LCHIP, is here to testify and can speak to that um, more closely. LCHIP is often held up in our state as a model for how state dollars can achieve tremendous leverage and bring tangible benefits to the state's people. This is something we should be looking to build upon and not weaken. A big part of the success of this model is its statewide focus along with dedicated and trained staff capacity to make sure resources are being used in the most effective way possible. LCHIP has trained professional staff and qualified boards that board members that work with a variety of stakeholders to make judgments and decisions to ensure LCHIP expenditures are in the public interest. I would also like to note that this bill is frankly unnecessary as counties can raise the capital needed to meet their needs without rating a state program. Um, the counties do set their own budgets, as you are well aware, uh, raise their own revenue and have access to municipal and private sector bonds, which are at historically low interest rates currently. All of these options are available to meet the priorities of county government. These options would also provide the counties a quicker and more holistic solution to achieving their goals. The proposed LCHIP fund raid brings in only a small percentage of the funding necessary to complete the proposed work meaning many years will be required to complete the task. There are other funding options available to the counties, as you clearly just heard from the previous speaker, that would more quickly meet the needs and are better aligned with the proposed project. 
Uh, with that, uh, and actually before I, before I conclude, I, I would like to note that according to LTRIP, every dollar invested by this program into our state's natural and historic resources leverages an additional $5 in investment, which makes LTRIP a very efficient use of public dollars. Uh, and so with that, our organizations, New Hampshire Lakes, the Nature Conservancy, New Hampshire Audubon, and the Appalachian Mountain Club jointly ask that this committee vote an expedient to legislate on this bill and continue our state's longstanding tradition of not only valuing our natural resources, but also upholding the integrity of a dedicated fund with a long history of bipartisanship. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mrs. Vagris. Uh, questions from the committee? Questions from the committee? Seeing none, then we will go on to a Will Stewart, who's a lobbyist with uh, Stay Work Play New Hampshire in opposition to the bill. And he says two minutes. And let's see how close he goes to two minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will uh, try to keep it under two minutes for sure. Um, again, for the record, Stay Work Play. Uh, I'm Will Stewart, the Executive Director, and Stay Work Play is a statewide nonprofit whose mission is to attract and retain young people. Um, you might recall I was before the committee this morning talking about the uh, study committee with regard to you know, child care. And uh, here again to, um, to speak to this bill and to state our opposition. I think uh, Ms. Vargas you know, gave a great explanation of, of why it's a bad idea. And uh, you might recall in my earlier testimony, I mentioned that uh, about three years ago that Stay Work Play commissioned a survey to collect data on why young people you know, stay in and might leave New Hampshire. And uh, the number one reason we found in that, uh, in that survey uh, that young people stay here is access to our state's unparalleled natural resources. And we heard this again last fall and winter as we talked to young people in nine locations across the state as part of our policy and pint series. So, you know, to our mind, we want to do all that we can to, to maintain and to the extent we can enhance, you know, our state's uh, natural resources, our, uh, our golden goose, if you will. And uh, so, you know, we oppose on principle any uh, any proposition to reduce or, uh, or kill this golden goose that is our state's natural resources. And for that reason, you know, we ask you to, uh, to vote inexpedient to legislate on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, any questions of Mr. Stewart? Saying none, then we go to uh, Representative Jigian, uh, who's Thank for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I signed up, I may have signed up errantly because I signed up because the prime sponsor, Representative McConkie asked me to introduce an amendment to the bill, but is that amendment to be introduced during a work session or would you want it introduced now? You could introduce it now, uh, but you can also introduce it in the work session. Okay, well, I guess in the interest of time, we'll, we'll introduce it in the uh, work session. It's a minor change um, that clarifies um, and creates a register of deeds restoration account under RSA 47817K. So it's pretty straightforward. So I think we'll introduce, uh, I can introduce it uh, during our work session. I thank you, uh, Representative. Thank you. The, um, on the list that I have, unless there's somebody else in the attendee. Uh, I just let Digit Taylor in. She was the last one to testify. She signed up for zero minutes. Sorry about that. It was my first time signing up and I missed the block on the form. And how long do you plan on testifying? Under five minutes, but I probably know more about LCHIP than anybody else on this call. So I think what I have to say may be interesting to you. All right. Uh, we'll do the five minutes, but I'm going to cut you off at five minutes. <laughs> I think that's fair. You all have had an incredibly long day. I listened in on the previous bill, and that was only one of many that you have sat through. Great. Representative Major and the rest of the committee, thank you very much for hearing me and for the hard work that you put in every day to keep the state running as smoothly as possible. 
I am Digit Taylor. I've been the executive director of LCHIP since 2010. It is a great honor to serve the state in this capacity. We think, and we've been told repeatedly, that we are one of the best functions that the state provides to the citizens. LCHIP was created in 2000 by the legislature with overwhelming support. And its purpose is described in the first paragraph of the statute, which Ms. Vargas read to you recently. Um, it, the, we are intended to conserve and preserve important natural, cultural, and historic resources through acquiring land or interest in lands and resources with matching grants and private, private, private partnerships. So the difference between what we do and what this proposal has is we acquire land and interest in lands and we do it through matching grants, neither of which seems to be quite the case with this proposed legislation. We have a long history of success. I hope you have in front of you the beautifully colored handout that I provided for you showing some examples of LCHIP projects and um, listing, listing the numbers of projects that we've done and, and so forth. But given the length of your day, I will not try to read through all of those. Oops, just lost my notes. Um, you probably want to know where our money comes from. And all of the money that we give out in grants comes from these fees that are, are collected at the registries of deeds. This, this was created in 2009 as a dedicated fund to support our grant making. Um, and these fees currently bring us in about three and a half to $4 million a year. The registries, as Ms. Scott said, get to keep 5% of that to cover their time and trouble in collecting the fees. Um, and the estimates that are in the fiscal note come largely from my estimates. And um, so the amount of money that LCHIP would get if this were to be enacted would be less and we would be less able to um, respond to the requests that we get for funding. We already do not have enough money to meet the, the requests that we get from applicants. Last year, we received 65 applications looking for nearly $9 million. In 2019, there were 67, 57 applications looking for $7.5 million. And we just, the, the $3.5 to $4 million just isn't enough. So we're turning down really good projects simply because we don't have enough money. We agree that the archival restoration of the official land records is important to everyone who deals with real estate and transactions in the state, not just to LCHIP. However, protecting them and preserving them is outside the realm of what the legislature wisely created for LCHIP to do. It is of course up to the legislature to decide what to do with this bill. But to me, it doesn't make sense to give LCHIP less money when we are all, we're already flooded with requests for the money that we do have and the less money would be going to something that our program was not designed to protect. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions if that is helpful and if you have the tolerance for it. That is great. You only used three, three minutes. Super. Uh, questions? Uh, hold on one second. Try to get to the right panelists. Uh, Representative Elmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, I'm on my Conservation Commission, and I think we did manage to use partially LCHIP once. We do a lot more land acquisition than that because um, we've got a strong uh, fund from our uh, property, um, current use property coming out into development. But on my question was, I've been under the impression that the local community has to raise about half the money ahead of time before they can apply for one of these so that they can go ahead with the project once they've got your part of it. On, and it's on considerable risk for them when you can only provide half of, of the applicants with a grant. Yes, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right that we do require matching funds. We don't require that it be in hand at the time of the application being submitted, but a project that has that money in hand um, scores better than one that does not. Um, a more recent, two more recent projects in Lebanon, the Rogers House, which is elderly housing, and the, um, the, the music school, the Upper, Upper Valley Music School across the, across the green from, from the Rogers House. So we have done some nice historic preservation projects in Lebanon as well. Yes, I'd just like to add that 
Rogers House was the Rogers Hotel and I think dates back about 150 years and the highwaymen and other things like that. You had your own pirates in Lebanon. This elderly housing. Uh, further questions of Mrs. Taylor? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for listening. Now, uh, Jean, do we have anybody else? There is one more hand raised, not um, signed up. Uh, a Actually, there's two now, a Matt Leahy and a Jeffrey Gilbert. Okay. Um, let's find out Matt Leahy. Okay, I'm letting him in. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I hope you all can hear me. Um, and Mr. Leahy, are you in support or opposition to the uh, bill? I am opposed to the bill. And for the record, um, my name is Matt Leahy. I work for the Forest Society. And how uh, long do you? Uh, no more than two minutes. I'll be very brief. Um, and just, you know, for the record, uh, the Forest Society has received LCHIP grants um, in the past, just so I just want the community to know that. Uh, but as I said, we are opposed to the bill. Um, and although we, you know, we do understand the importance, you know, to the counties to You're undertake the up. maybe lean into your microphone. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we do understand the importance to the counties to, um, you know, undertake this repair and archival work. Our concern is, though, that this work is going to be coming um, or or at places at least part of the burden on LCHIP to undertake. Um, and I would just point out one thing that, um, you know, state statute 478 colon one actually puts the responsibility for this type of work on the counties, um, not on LCHIP. And as Digit mentioned, um, you know, this, you know, taking this uh, additional money from LCHIP's budget will simply, um, you know, put more pressure on LSHIP to, to carry out its mission and to try to meet the demand for its programs. And so again, we are opposed to the bill. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Leahy. Questions? Switch over here. I don't see any questions, so the next one is- Mr. Chairman, yeah. I believe that Jeff Gilbert is the Jeff Gilbert that was your vice chair a long time ago. Oh, I'm ready to bring him in right now. Okay. Represent I mean Jeff Gilbert, could you let him in? He said I I hope you folks can hear me. First of all, it's a privilege to come before this committee again and Representative Almy is correct. Um, I served uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, uh, Chairman Majors uh, quite some years ago uh, as vice chair and greatly enjoyed my opportunity to work with you folks and, and in particular, of course, uh, have been a longtime champion of LCHIP. Uh, and also as Representative Almi specifically knows, have taken a strong interest in dedicated funds and dedicated funds being used properly for the purposes for which they were dedicated in the initial instance and uh, uh, also with full disclosure of what the funds do. Um, I'm appearing here the, the, this afternoon on behalf of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, of which I am a trustee, uh, and we urge the rejection of House Bill 621, uh, which, as you all have ha heard <laughs> a great deal of testimony about, is diverting funds from this program uh, for other purposes, which are not uh, those that are uh, central to the program itself. Uh, there's been a certainly much testimony, so I'll try not to take very long, but to just emphasize a couple of points. Uh, the dedicated fund was originally conceived uh, as one which had nexus uh, to uh, the purposes of LCHIP. Uh, the source of funding, in fact, uh, makes a great deal of sense when you consider that LCHIP's programs indeed contribute significantly to the quality of life uh, in New Hampshire and enhance as a result of that not only the enjoyment of our citizens, of so many of our resources, both be they land or be they cultural or be they historic, but it also raises property values in the process. Uh, and one of the key things uh, that uh, are two key points I'd like to uh, reemphasize. 
the program has been under uh, has been oversubscribed and underfunded for many many years. Uh, this is a program which historically, um, as I believe Digit Taylor testified, uh, has at nearly two or two and a half times the demand with quality projects uh, that simply uh, can't be funded. Uh, so any diversion of funds from this uh, purpose would be a significant dilution of its great uh, goals and objectives, which I think have truly uh, been remarkable in what they've done for the state over the 20 years of the program. One element that is particularly uh, significant is that often LCHIP funds serve as the critical equity component for a project uh, because it is a grant. And as a grant uh, often is essential uh, to add to other sources of funding. As I think Digit testified, uh, almost all the projects require significant additional funding and LCHIP achieves that ability to leverage that, that funding, whether it's from bank sources or whether it's from community uh, uh, funds that are raised otherwise. So it, it produces a five or six to one benefit to the communities that, it, that uh, the projects are located in uh, and makes the community stronger, creates additional uh, community support, and overall, I think, improves our quality of life. I certainly hope that you do uh, take the step in ITL the bill. Uh, LCHIP, if anything, needs considerably more funding, not less. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Jeff. Um, Representative Bromley has a question. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Gilbert, thank you for your testimony. So <clears throat> being, a, being a state rep for a while there, you, you, you probably had a chance to observe county government and I think it was mentioned earlier that most registries of deeds generate more revenue than they, their expense. Therefore, the counties use the excess for other things within the county. Is that, is that your observation as well? That, that is generally my understanding. And, and uh, not speaking to the merits or demerits of preserving the records, which I think is a lofty goal. It's just this shouldn't be the source of funding for that goal. The county uh, has other resources available to it, uh, which some of which could be short term, uh, such as uh, the typical annual funds, but also long term in terms of bonding. Uh, the comments were made today. Bonding is at an extraordinarily low cost for uh, for for the counties, uh, which could be utilized uh, very readily for this purpose uh, and not uh, be diluting uh, the the other enormous benefits that LCHIP brings. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. the Honorable Jeffrey Gilbert? I don't see any. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. Yeah. Any further people wish to testify for or against House Bill 621? If not, I'm going to close the hearing on House Bill 621, and we will be addressing it at our work session on the 2nd of March. A long day. Oui. Any, any comments from the committee? If not, then we'll call it quits. Thank you. Same.